Golden Age Radio is starting now. Subscribe to get future updates. Get ready for some spy thrillers and noir detective mysteries with The Man Called X, Secret Agent K7, Dangerous Assignments, Richard Diamond, Dick Tracy, The Avengers, Whistler, Shadow, Falcon, and Top Secret. You're twice as sure with two great names. And General Motors. Frigidaire presents The Man Called X, starring Herbert Marshall. With the music of Johnny Green. Directed by Jeff Johnstone. And now Frigidaire presents Herbert Marshall as the man called X. International troubleshooter who flies the ocean at the drop of a hat, who charms the ladies, but is death on crooks. Herbert Marshall as the man called X. Quiet tonight, Dr. Dawson. If you will forgive my playing with words, is it this Pacific influence? The ocean of oceans, Professor. And now we cross the Tropic of Capricorn. Mm, Capricorn is the goat, which nibbles at the stars. Aye, and from here on, the world turns upside down. <laughs> winter is summer and summer winter. It's a little like standing on one's head. Ah, but there's still the moon in its proper course. The moon is scowling, Dr. Dawson. Doesn't like that cloud. And you, you seem depressed. Professor, I must ask you a question. Yes? You were invited on this expedition to the Antarctic for the same reason we all were. Field research. An exciting project, isn't it? I have reason to believe that it's not research that interests you, but conquest. The clouds don't like the moon's face, Professor. The moon is blotted out. It shall be as dark for you. Oh, no, it wouldn't. Oh, oh. Hmm. Well, man overboard. Man overboard! Hello, Chief. Well, stranger, Ken Thurston. Nice to see you back again, Mr. X. Glad to be back, Chief. Sorry I can't stay longer. <laughs> well, I see you haven't changed any. How quickly can you get me on a plane for Santiago, Chile? On the first one out, if it's important enough. Chief, I have a bit of, of compelling interest in science. Oh, yeah? In fact, I'd like to confirm a theory with those distinguished gentlemen aboard the SS Archimedes. Oh, that expedition... Since when have you become interested in meteorology? Since Dr. Stuart Dawson of the University of Edinburgh was um, lost at sea. Mm, I read that report. Dawson was a geologist, wasn't he? He was also one of the world's leading authorities on uranium deposits. Uh-oh. That make it important enough? Important? At the moment, I can't think of anything more important to us. Ellis, get passage on the first plane out to South America for Ken Thurston. Where are you going to pick him up, Ken? The Archimedes has put in a Valparaiso to take on supplies. They'll be at least a couple of weeks in Chile. Well, remember, Ken, one of the largest foundations in this country has subsidized that expedition. It's on the level. They're just a bunch of stargazers checking up on a new world in Antarctica. Ah, uh, a new world with the power to blow up the old one.
flight number 12, now arriving Santiago from Buenos Aires on Ramp 3. Passengers. Postcards! Postcards! Get your postcards here! Big jumbo folder of 12 colored photographs of moonlight at the Andes. Hey, amigo, only two pesos. Postcards pretty. Hey! Hey, Mr. Thurston! Oh, you! Who, Mr. Thurston? Pagon Zellschmidt. Hello, Mr. Thurston. Oh, someday I must go to the equator, Pagon, where there is no shadow. Maybe you won't be there. Oh, thank you, Mr. Thurston. I knew you would be pleased to see me. Well, that's one interpretation of what I was just saying. Oh, thank you. Is it worth any money? All right, Pagon, come on. We can talk about money, but I find a hotel. Oh, that has been all arranged. And I have saved you what you owe me in commissions by sleeping in your room until you arrive. You think of everything. Come on. Mr. X, while waiting for your plane, I saw a rainbow and a pot of gold at the end of it. I don't see any rainbow, Pagan. And we are only at the beginning. You see, Mr. X, it's as plain as mud. Those scientific professors are really looking for gold. Of course, they've taken you into their confidence, Pega. Well, the waterfront at Valparaiso is full of gossips. And some friends of mine, riffraff, but strictly high class, mm. are working on their ship. So you've taken advantage of your international subterranean connections. Oh, Mr. Thurston, Okay, can... what have you really found out, Pega? Well, I wanted to speak to you about that, Mr. X. You see, I followed the professors from the harbor to their hotel in Santiago. But when I presented my credentials... The door was slammed in my foot. Unbelievers. Oh, don't worry, don't worry. I have other plans. You see, a fancy reception for them is being given tomorrow night by a rich old woman, the Senora Margarita Avila. Avila? Well, that must be the wife of Professor Avila. Hmm. Someone I should know? A lot of money. Oh, go on. Very successful scientist. Yes, yes, he interests me. Too late, Pagan. He died five years ago. Oh, but the old lady still has the money. Now, now there is something I could work on. Uh, Pagan, would you like to do me a favor? Mr. X, your slightest command is my wish. Good. Then uh, let me work on it. Senor? Excuse me, is Senora Avila at home? Yes, she is. My name's Ken Thurston. May I speak to her? Come in, please. Thank you. Well? Well? Will she be coming down soon? <laughs> that is impossible, Mr. Thurston. Well, isn't she at home? Of course she is at home. But then... Oh, no! No, it can't be that good. I beg your pardon, Senor? You're not the senora. But why not? You're so young and so beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. Is that so shocking? No. Now it's much easier to ask you a favor. Oh? You're entertaining the distinguished members of the Archimedes expedition tomorrow evening? Yes. I'd like to meet them. You see, I'm a kind of a footloose correspondent. Correspondent? I, I don't like the conventional interviews. So... Ah, uh, if you attended my reception as a guest, you could get your information informally. Yes, that's it, yeah. Well, can you think of any reason why I should refuse to cooperate with you? Well, after all, I am a stranger. A stranger bearing compliments. I shall be pleased if you will join us tomorrow evening, Mr. Thurston. On one condition. On any condition. You must no longer regard yourself as a stranger. Of course, Mr. Thurston, the vast majority of laymen think of the Antarctic as a wasteland, of no consequence whatever. But, Dr. Thorio, haven't a lot of people read of Admiral Byrd's discoveries? Oh, yes, indeed, but to them it's merely an adventure story. They have no idea of the vast resources of this immense continent. I've heard rumors about gold. Mr. Thurston, I'm not speaking of material wealth, though, of course, there must be an abundance of that. Oh, yes, yeah, I'm, so I'm, I'm referring to the fuller knowledge of the nature of our two poles. I understand that clearly. Uh, uh, sir, 
Uh, with the controls that we'll eventually establish, mm -hmm. we shall at last have nature on our side. A very pleasant and I... prospect, Dr. Florio. Oh. Even though it would put us all out of business. Uh, Professor Sador, uh, you met this young fellow, Thurston? How do you do, Mr. Thurston? Senora Avila has mentioned you. Yes, I, I've just been explaining to Thurston here about the real implications of our expedition. Implications, Dr. Florio? I thought everything was out in the open. We haven't any secrets. Or have we? Well, what, whatever secrets we have, Professor, represent the failures in our search for truth. Uh, now, first, in, in your Mr. Thurston, on... if, uh, if Dr. Florio can spare you for a few moments, our hostess would like to speak to you. Oh, yes, yes, of course. Uh, uh, but I will see you later, Thurston. Yes, yes, of course. <laughs> Thurston, how can such a windbag have room left for an idea in his head? He knows his physics, though, doesn't he? Oh, yes, yes, that's the trouble. He knows so much in his field that he hasn't the slightest notion of what goes on outside. Judging from his eloquence, he's trying awfully hard to make contact. <laughs> well, when you get tired of Florio, try Gallahoo. Uh-huh. He never says a word. Very relaxing on a voyage. Your voyage didn't have a very auspicious beginning, did it, Professor Sador? Uh, you mean Dr. Dawson's death? Uh-huh. You know, I wonder why he ever sailed with us. Didn't the foundation select him? Yes, of course, but Dawson didn't have to get on the Archimedes to take that way out. Suicide? Thurston, he was at the end of his rope. Tried to run away from a domestic situation and found out he couldn't run away from himself. Uh, scientists can be fallible, too. Very. Well, here we are. Senora Avila. Oh, thank you, senor. Uh, Mr. Thurston, there is someone here asking for you, a Professor Zellschmidt. Zellschmidt? Zellschmidt? Yes, he calls himself... Elepidopterist Pluribus. Oh, that's Zellschmidt. Looking for butterflies in Santiago? Oh, you never know about a Zellschmidt. He can look for anything, anywhere. Oh, well, since you know him, then he's all right. You let him in? Oh, he left me no choice. Shall we find him? Senora, if Professor Sedo will excuse us, I'd much rather dance. Senora Avila. Yes, Mr. Thurston? At least... While we're dancing, may I call you Margarita? Have I refused any of your requests so far, Ken? I'm indebted to you. Have you found what you were looking for? Much more than I was looking for. Oh? Uh, Ken, would you mind? It's rather warm, and my garden is lovely by moonlight. I'd love to see it. I meant you to. I noticed that Dr. Florio was monopolizing your time. But after all, he is the head of the expedition. He expressed his opinions very freely to me. Yes, I know what you mean. Uh, did you find Professor Sedor interesting? Margarita, I have a confession to make. Oh? My interest is no longer journalistic. Oh, are you disappointed in your material? Oh, no, no. I'm just beginning to discover its possibilities. Then do me a favor, Ken. Promise me that you will let me read your articles when they are finished. Who was talking about articles? Oh, <laughs> then we have been talking about two different things. I was talking about you. I'm sorry I interrupted you. Go on. I've heard so many long words tonight, I'm beginning to appreciate understatement. Understatement? Perhaps I should demonstrate. You see, I could try to be grandiloquent, but the way I feel is more like Oh. oh, Ken. Why did you kiss me? I could say that it was in the interest of science, Margarita, but uh, the simpler reason is I just wanted to. party was a great success. Thank you, Sidor. And the American, Mr. Thurston, was very attentive, wasn't he? Does that matter? You were very responsive. <laughs> Sidor, you're jealous. Why did you invite him? He asked me to. Margarita, have you gone out of your mind? No. 
But I may have lost a little of my heart. You will stop this nonsense, my dear, when I tell you who Mr. Thurston really is. Oh, is that all that's bothering you? What? Darling, I know all about Mr. Thurston. He is handsome, he is gallant, he is intelligent. And he is the man called Lex. Good night. Now to return to Frigidaire's Man Called X, starring Herbert Marshall. Mr. X has gone to Santiago, Chile, to find out why Dr. Stuart Dawson, a famous scientist, disappeared at sea while on the Archimedes expedition. Mr. X has met various members of the expedition at the home of beautiful Margarita Avila. But he still has no evidence of foul play. On the other hand, Margarita and her friend, Professor Sador, have learned that he is the Man Called X. Ken has returned home from Margarita's reception and at the moment is entering his hotel room. What took you so long, Mr. Thurston? Oh, here you are, Professor Zell Schmidt. I wondered where you'd slipped off to. Catch any butterflies? A golden butterfly, Mr. X. Huh? While you were pursuing the beautiful lady, which I saw out of the side of my eyes, I was needling the very top men of the expedition. Dr. Florio? In person. And here he will to meet the whole plot. No. Yeah. What plot? Dr. Flory said it was a golden opportunity. Doesn't that tell you something? Yes, it tells me your interest in the project. I hate to disabuse your mind, but this expedition isn't a gold mine. Nor am I. Night. You don't know what you're doing, Mr. Thurston. Now, if you're worrying about your face as... Pagon! What? What? Pagon, the transom, duck! What? What was that? That page on was our golden opportunity. Gone. It is no longer as fashionable to promenade in Santiago as it used to be. But, Ken, I did want you to see Park Forest Hall. Lovely, Margarita. Practically in the center of the city, but you'd feel as though you were miles away. Isn't that what parks are for? To get away? Uh, Margarita, your reception for the scientists, are you really interested or is it your devotion to the memory of your husband? Both, Ken. That was why I married my husband. Oh, not for science alone. You see, a woman is denied the adventurous life. She must live vicariously by keeping in contact with people who find adventure. Adventure in laboratories? Laboratories can lead to expeditions. Oh, why were you not honest with me, Mr. X? Oh, where did that come from? Your butterfly professor offers all kinds of bargains. You think Pagan was a publicity agent of mine? If you'll be frank with me now. Maybe I can help you. Just what are you looking for? A reason for murder, and probably something even more important. Murder? Why would a man, worrying about family difficulties, commit suicide somewhere in the Pacific Ocean when he had no family? You are speaking of poor Dr. Dawson. Did you know him? No, but I cannot believe it. This learned gentleman on the Archimedes... Why would they want to get rid of him? That, Margarita, is what is even more important. Ned? Oh, hello, Professor. Good afternoon, Mr. Thurston. Come in. I'd like to, but I have a lot of details to attend to in connection with the expedition. But you wanted to see me? That is one of the more important details. Oh. I have talked this over with my colleagues, Mr. Thurston, and we all feel that we should have with us, shall we say, a, a scribe to keep a chronicle of our voyage. 
Mm-hmm. How would you like that? Well, who could refuse such a tempting offer? It's a golden opportunity. And you'll come? Yes. Good. But we sail in the morning. Can you be ready by then? Ready now. Splendid. We'll all be very happy to have you with us. And now, goodbye, Mr. Thurston. Goodbye, Professor. Mr. Thurston, you didn't even mention me. While you're going off to the South Pole, what am I supposed to do? Pagan, you try the North Pole. Evening, Dr. Florio. Oh, hello, Thurston. You still up? Nice out on deck tonight. Uh, a bit cold. Uh, have you seen Dr. Gillihue? Uh, he went inside with Professor Capstout. Oh, I should think about 15 minutes ago. Hmm. Well, I think I'll turn in, too. By the way, Thurston, glad to have you with us. Any assistance I can give you to authenticate your notations, just call on them. Thanks, Doctor. Good night. Good night. Mr. Thurston. So you didn't take my advice, Pagan. Stow away? I should have thought of that. Here I'm working as a deckhand. You won't make as much money that way as you did by telling Senora Avila that I'm the man called X. Oh, Mr. Thurston, how can you say such things? How much did you get for it? Oh, a paltry little... What am I saying? I haven't even confessed. You don't have to, Pagan. Skip it. Oh, maybe it's just as well, because now you can do something for me at my price. Congratulations, Margarita. Oh, it's you, Ken. I was going to surprise you at the captain's table in the morning. So now it's no more vicarious living for you. It's real adventure, is that it? Why not? Why should I stay at home and dream? This trip may not be a picnic, Margarita. I know. But after all, I suggested you the Sedor. I got you into this, Ken. Oh? So I want to share it with you. Don't you think adventure and romance should go together? Well, it's much more pleasant that way. To make a long voyage shorter. Much shorter. Oh, do you mind if I go in now? I'm not used to the sea air. I'll take you to your cabin. Oh, don't bother. Just kiss me goodnight, Ken. Margarita. Oh, now I shall sleep well. Good night, darling. Good night. Still up, Thurston? Well, no, Sado. Mind if I join you? Not a bit. Have you begun the log of our voyage yet? I don't know quite how to start. Why not begin with our leaving Valparaiso? That would be the easy way. But I have a feeling the story really begins with Dr. Dawson's death. That still bothers you, doesn't it, Thurston? Doesn't it bother you? What do you mean by that? Dr. Dawson must have bothered you. He knew so much about uranium. So? Almost as much as you do, Professor Sador. Very foolish of you to mention Dawson's family to me, since he didn't have any. Yes, very foolish. And it was very foolish of you, Mr. X, to accept my invitation. Don't move. Huh? You didn't shoot Dawson. I didn't think that was your method. It isn't. This is... Goodbye, Mr. X. You have to do it that way, Stelor. You didn't offer any other suggestions, my dear Margarita? No. No. I saw that farewell scene of yours. Very touching. Well, he's done. There is only one thing, Stelor. It was too easy. <laughs> so heavy to pull up, like pulling up a whale. There. There. Oh. Oh, hold me, Mr. Thurston. I think I'm going to faint. Pagan, remember this moment. It may never happen again. You've chiseled, you've double-crossed me. You've lied to me, but right now, 
You're a great man. You saved my life. Oh, oh I only did what you told me to, Mr. X. Huh? It wasn't anything. But you might tell me why you let somebody throw you overboard just so I could save you. Now, later, Pagan, right now I'd like some sleep. I have an appointment at the captain's table for breakfast tomorrow. this morning. I haven't seen him, Dr. Florio. Perhaps he hasn't got his sea legs yet. <laughs> Nonsense, Sador. I saw him walking the deck last night. He wasn't having any trouble then. I saw him too. He seemed to be enjoying himself. Well, if he's sleeping, let him sleep. Now, what was I saying anyway, Gallagher? Good morning, Margaret Ripper. Gentlemen. Well, Who was talking about me? Ken. Good morning. Aren't you going to wish me good morning, Professor Sador? After all, you reminded me last night you invited me on this voyage. Fine. Why? What? Uh, what? What's happened here? Dr. Florio and gentlemen, forgive me for being late for breakfast, but you see, I overslept. I had a swim last night. Swim? Swim? What in the name of... It wasn't you... my idea, Dr. Florio. Professor Sedor's. If Dr. Dawson were here, I'm sure he too could tell you about going for a long swim in the Pacific. A swim with no end. For him. You can put away that gun, Sador. You couldn't shoot anybody here. Besides, that would be mutiny. Ship's crews been advised as well as the authorities at Valparaiso. <laughs> well, this doesn't sound like a laughing matter to me, Senor Avila. Oh, for me, I am amused. Because for once, I spoke the truth. Remember, Sador, I said it was too easy. Well, Ken... You have won. No, Margarita. You and Sado have lost. Gentlemen, I think it would be best for the good name of the profession you serve that this particular incident of your expedition be not included in our chronicle. Professor Sado and his friend, who finds it so amusing, were planning to use you for their own purposes. They were playing high stakes, almost the highest. Uranium. But as you see, they had too many cards stacked against them. Mmm, coffee. Well, perhaps a good cup of coffee will brighten this day on the cruise of the SS Archimedes. star Herbert Marshall will return in just a moment to tell you about next week's exploit of The Man Called X. The Man Called X is presented each week with the best wishes of your Frigidaire dealer. We invite you to come in and learn about the famous line of Frigidaire electric refrigerators, electric ranges, electric water heaters, home freezers, and a wide variety of refrigerating and air conditioning equipment. <laughs> Now, Frigidaire star, Herbert Marshall. Next week, a chase to Central America after a notorious racketeer who talks best with a 38 automatic. And with him is his all-too-beautiful daughter. I promise you plenty of thrills and suspense. As usual, Leon Velasco will be with us as Pagan Zellerschmidt. So join us, won't you, when next I return as the man called X. Good night. <laughs> Frigidaire's Man Called X for tonight was written by Milton Merlin. The music is composed and conducted by Johnny Green, and the entire production is under the direction of Jack Johnstone. And so until next week, same time, same station, this is Wendell Niles speaking for Frigidaire, made only by General Motors. All characters and incidents used on this program are fictitious. Any resemblance to actual persons or incidents is purely coincidental. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.
You are listening to Golden Age Radio, rumble.com slash C slash G-A-R. Brought to you by G3PL.com. Subscribe for more videos. Number one adventurer, K-7, former United States secret agent who operated in 22 countries, on land, on sea, and in the air, brings you another story of today. Here is K-7. Ladies and gentlemen, in the early months of 1939, the governments of many countries found dissension within the ranks of their cabinets and councils. Some of the lawmakers were outspoken for peace. Others favored strong demands and a militaristic attitude toward the world. Members of this latter group in one country formed the Blood and Steel Society. This society was ruthless. Some patriots and officials who opposed war were murdered or forced to accept the society's views. It is the story of the Blood and Steel Society and how it was crushed that my old friend John Holbrook introduces now. Thank you, K-7. In these troubled days in the world's history, there are many plots and counterplots which are never made public. It is the story of such a plot which K-7 tells now. It begins as two high officials of a foreign government confer with each other. I issued a statement to the newspapers this morning, Torak. I intend to go through with my speech. It is my duty. The people should know the situation we face. I agree with you, Kovac. But look at this. A letter. You too. Yes. I too have been threatened with death because I support you. They know I do not approve of their military plans. Our people want peace, Kovac. And I intend to fight side by side with you. Thank you, Adolf. I felt sure of your support. It is one of the reasons I have come to you. This speech, it is the one I am to deliver before the citizens rally. I leave this copy with you. If anything should what happen... What are you saying, Paul? That if the Society of Blood and Steel should kill me, I want your promise to deliver the speech for me. You have that promise. And I will leave you. I'm so tired. Now wait, Paul. One thing more. You have your letter from the Society with you? Yes, I haven't even turned it over to the police. The court, give it to me. But why? Why do you want it? And because I have sent word to an old friend, secret agent K-7. I intend to smash this so-called society. They are a ring of murderers who threaten our peace. K-7. I've heard of him. But here, here is the letter. I leave it with you. Now I must go. Thank you for your promise to deliver my speech. If they should... Enough, Paul. They would not dare harm you. I'm not so sure. Well, good night. Good night. I still have work to do, or I would go with you. I understand. Tomorrow's an important day. The committee meets again. Yes. And I'm afraid of the results of the meeting. Good night, Paul. Good night, my friend. Paul. Paul. What have they done to you? A few hours later, the voice of K-7 cracked through the ether over a secret radio wavelength set aside for diplomatic messages. Monsieur Toros, 
An ocean separates us. It would be useless for me to attempt to come to you in time to be of assistance. I am sending my friend, Agent M, who is already near you. Trust him implicitly. This is K-7 speaking. The next day, an airplane landed on the small airfield outside the capital city. A short time later, Monsieur Torok received a visitor. Mademoiselle, you, you are a special agent? No, monsieur. Only the assistant of Special Agent M. M is here. He has sent me to you because he prefers to remain unknown for the present. But you are, uh, you are young and beautiful. What can you do? I can help you, monsieur. First, the certain letters. You have them? Yes. Then give them to me. M wishes to examine the handwriting. Of course, you can have them. But how can they help? Neither you nor even M knows anyone here. M has his own methods of operating, monsieur. Already he's setting up his laboratory. He asked me to get the letters. I place myself in your hands. Here are the letters. Take them. Thank you, monsieur. Tomorrow you will make the speech Monsieur Kovac intended to make? Yes, mademoiselle. Tomorrow I speak for my friend. If I am allowed to live until then. You will speak, monsieur. And you will use what is in this package. M has sent it to you. The instructions are inside. Now I must go back to M. I may communicate with you later. Good luck, monsieur. And tomorrow, speak as you have never spoken before. Speak for peace. With those words, Yvonne departed, leaving a mysterious package on Monsieur Torok's desk. A few hours later, she stood at M's side as he used a powerful microscope. There were two men, Ivan. These bullets prove it. Monsieur Kovac died from a bullet fired from a forty-five revolver. The second one is from a thirty-eight. It would not have been fatal. But, M, we have less than 24 hours. How are you going to trace the gun? We won't have time to do that, Ivan. But we have time to do something else. We're going to find the identity of the two men who fired the shots by tracing the handwriting and the two threatening notes Torok and Kovac received. How can we in so short a time? My plan is already in operation. Now, here, I'll show you. Now, we've both got to work fast. Do you see these papers? Yes. Why, they are petitions. Exactly, Ivan. They are petitions for war. Tonight, the lawmakers are all here in the city. They gathered in the hotel lobbies talking of Torok's speech and of Kovac's death. We are going to circulate among them and get signatures for these petitions. Then you will compare. Is that it? That's it. It's a long chance, Ivan, but we must take it. M and Ivan met with fair success. They went to the hotels and cafes and asked all to sign their petition. Their work was completed a little, a little after midnight. They had more than 100 names. They went immediately to M's temporary laboratory and started the difficult job of comparing. Ivan, I found it. Look at the signature. K. Zalder. It's the same M. You will arrest him. Oh, no, that would be too dangerous. There may be others. Well, then how are you going I'm to... I'm going to trail him, Ivan. I'm going to stay at his side until after Torok has made a speech. Then, if nothing has happened, I'll place him under arrest. How can I help you? There is nothing you can do now, Ivan. Uh, it's nearly 4 a.m. Uh, go to your room and sleep. And tomorrow? Tomorrow, when the public assembles in the great square, be in the front ranks. Watch for me. Unless I am mistaken, this killer, Zorda, will also be there when Torque begins to speak. I will be at his side. I am to come to you. Uh, yes, if you can. If anything happens, keep calm. The police will be with me. In case of a disturbance, the men causing it will be seized and rushed to a room underneath the speaker stand before the crowd knows what has happened. If there is a disturbance, come to me there. Your pass will let you through. I'll be there, Em, at your side. The next day found a great crowd in the square of the capital. There were flags and shouts for peace. Then Monsieur Torak, the Patriot, was introduced. Monsieur Torak is here to read the speech of his dead friend, Paul Kovac, who was also your friend. It is fitting that we should be quiet as he talks to us in his sorrow. Monsieur Torak. Fellow citizens, Paul was my friend. He came to me on the night he died and asked that I take his place if 
if anything happened. Paul Kovac, a great patriot, knew he was a marked man. I suppose that now I also have been marked for death. But our country calls, and I must say what is in my heart. As the patriot spoke, a beautiful woman among the front ranks of the citizens moved quietly to the side of M. It was Ivan. Both she and M watched a man who stood just in front of them. Suddenly, the man's hand moved toward his pocket. Ivan uttered a warning. M, he's going to shoot. Don't touch your guns, Arda. I have you covered. Who are you? You're under arrest, Arda. Walk straight ahead to the door and to the speaker's platform. You can't stop the society of blood and steel. Walk straight ahead, I said. Ivan, follow us. M, Ivan, and their prisoner, Zauda, had almost reached the door that led to the room under the speaker stand when suddenly a shot rang out from another quarter. The speaker faltered. As the police jumped on the man who had fired, the crowd stood still in awe. Mr. Tolak, he's been shot. Oh, he'll be all right, Ivan. He's wearing a bulletproof vest. That is what was in the package you left on his desk. Now, come on, we've got to get this man under the stand. The crowd might get out of order. The other will be seized. Then Monsieur Torok continued. I am not injured, my friend. That shot, which was intended for me, should make you realize the kind of men who would plunge our country into war. They are desperate, unscrupulous. They care not for my life, nor for the lives of your sons and your daughters. A minute later, the man who had fired the bullet was also hustled under the stand by the police. There, M faced Zoda and the other would-be assassin. You have both failed. I charge both of you with the murder of Paul Kovac. You'll have to prove that we shot him. That proof is in my hands, Zoda. These two revolvers. This forty-five is yours. A bullet from this gun killed Paul Kovac. This other gun belonging to your accomplice is a thirty-eight. It, too, was used on Paul Kovac. All right, take him away. Yes, sir. Come on. M, are you sure Monsieur Torak is uninjured? Positive, Ivan. He was wearing the bulletproof vest you took to him. Suppose we step outside and hear the finish of his speech. Oh, I'd love to. You have heard my message. I hope the word peace will come from both your heart and your lips. Listen, Em. Our work here is finished. There will be no war here. Only lost in peace. You should be proud. Your work has made peace possible. For the time, the Society of Blood and Steel has been defeated. Whether or not it will be heard from again is problematical. For, unfortunately, right does not always conquer might in our world today. However, we must continue to work for peace. Listen for my next story. This is K-7 speaking.
You are listening to Golden Age Radio, rumble.com slash cd slash gar, brought to you by g3pl.com. Dangerous Assignment, starring Brian Donlevy as Steve Mitchell. You sent for me, Commissioner? Yes, sit down, Steve. I suppose you heard about Bill Thorne. Yeah, they pulled his body out of a river in eastern Panama. That's right. Bill was one of our best agents and one of your best friends, Steve. I figured you'd want to take over his assignment. I do. You've got it as of right now. And I'll give you the background quickly. Ruth, uh, how about Steve's credentials? I've got them already, Commissioner. Steve can pick them up at my desk. Good. Here's a setup, Steve. Shortly before the Japanese surrender, an entire boatload of Japanese weapons disappeared. We have reason to think they're hidden somewhere in Panama. And that whoever has them is willing to sell to the highest bidder. How many weapons are involved? Enough to equip three divisions. Hmm. Well, Bill Thorne must have been getting warm. Yes, that's obviously why he got killed. Steve, we can't afford to have a hidden cache of weapons that close to the canal. Who do I work with down there? Uh, Lieutenant Perez of the National Police in Panama City. Any other contacts who might help me? One. His name is Emil Fager. Mm. He owns a large plantation down there. Quite an influential man. Can we trust him? In this business, who knows? But he has done several favors for us in the past. When does my plane leave? Half an hour. Uh, Steve... I don't need to tell you about the danger involved. They've already killed Bill Thorne. They'll be gunning for you, too. As usual, you'll pose as a foreign correspondent. Actually, your job is to find those weapons. Yeah, and find out who killed Bill Thorne. Yes. Well, that's it. You've got your assignment, Steve. Good luck. The National Broadcasting Company welcomes back to the air Dangerous Assignment, starring Brian Donlevy as Steve Mitchell, colorful, two-fisted government agent. At all those places of the world where danger and intrigue walk hand in hand, there you will find Steve Mitchell on another Dangerous Assignment. Steve Mitchell is en route to Panama City by plane. Meanwhile, on a plantation in eastern Panama, near the forbidding and sinister Darien country, two men sit hunched over a powerful radio receiver. Steve Mitchell departed United States for Panama City. Believe he is taking over job of his late friend. Hmm. That does not surprise me, Carrero. I did not think they would let the matter of the weapons drop. We will try to give Mitchell the same reception here in Panama that we gave his friend Bill Thorne. Yes. You know what to do, Correro, at the first opportunity. Lieutenant Perez, I'm Steve Mitchell from the United States. Here are my credentials. Mm Mm-hmm. Hmm, see, si, Senor Mitchell. They appear to be in order. You've just arrived? Yeah, my plane landed about a half an hour ago. Please, sit down, Senor. Thanks. Say, uh, is it always this hot in Panama? Oh, no, Senor. It gets much hotter than this. Hmm, great. <laughs> I, uh, presume you wish information about Senor Bill Thorne? That's right. Well, I'm afraid there is very little I can tell you, Senor. Thorne's body was recovered from a river in the Darien country in eastern Panama. Was he already dead when he was pulled out of the river? No, not quite, but he lasted only a few seconds more. Look, uh, was he able to say anything at all about what had happened? No, senor. He only mumbled something about San Miguel. Then he died. San Miguel? What did he mean? Well, I I do not know, senor. It is very mystifying. However, there is an Indian village called San Miguel inland, in the Darien region. Here, it is at this point on the map. Mm Mm-hmm. How would I go about getting to San Miguel? Oh, senor, that is very bad country. What do you mean? The Darien country to the east, it is very wild. One can travel only by train or boat. And the Indians are very savage. 
Many people who enter that country are never seen again. It wasn't an Indian who killed Bill Thorne. But you still haven't told me how to get to San Miguel. Then you are determined to go? Of course. In that case, I will accompany you. Ah, let me see. I think we should notify Senor Fager of our intentions. Fager? See, si. we will journey up this river and here we will pass through land which is owned by him. Oh. It is customary to notify him when someone undertakes such a trip. Uh, would that be Emil Fager? See, si, Emil Fager. Why, do you know him, senor? I know of him. Matter of fact, I was told I might contact him for help. Oh, he has always been very cooperative about such things. Yes, we will go see him. He happens to be here in Panama City at present. He is staying at the International Hotel. Where's that? On the Cinco de Mayo Plaza in the center of town. We can walk there. In this heat? Oh, but, senor... Yeah, yeah, I know. It gets much hotter than this. Ah, <laughs> I thought we would find Senor Fega here in the lobby. Uh, that is he, the fat gentleman sitting in that chair by the window. Oh, uh, <laughs> he believes in service. I wish I had a guy to fan me. See, that is Senor Fega. Good afternoon, Senor. Ah, Lieutenant Perez. But I fail to see anything good about the afternoon, sir. With this infernal heat. Well, you should be accustomed to it by now, senor. Oh, I seem to feel it more when I come into town, senor. On my plantation, it doesn't bother me. But here, I must take Pepito and his fan wherever I go. Pepito, turn around. Fan the gentleman. Uh, senor, I would like to introduce senor Steve Mitchell, a correspondent from the United States. Delighted to make your acquaintance, sir. Mr. Fager. Well, what can I do for you, gentlemen? Senor Mitchell desires to see some of the Darien country. I have offered to take him up the river with me. The Darien country? Oh, you're an adventurous man, Mr. Mitchell. That region is not generally considered to be suitable for an outing. <laughs> so I'm told. I uh, understand you have a plantation somewhere up there. Oh, see, on this edge of the region, it's fairly civilized there, but beyond lies territory that not even I have ever set foot in. Pepito, you are lagging faster, faster. You know, this is the closest thing to a breeze I've felt since I left home. As we will be passing through your land part of the way, I thought I should ask your permission, Senor Fager. Granted, of course. Glad to have you, gentlemen. At least that portion of your journey will be safe. Would you like me to send one of my men with you? I don't think that'll be necessary, Mr. Fager. Thanks just the same. Oh, at, at least let me put one of my boats at your disposal. Well, you are most kind, senor. Not at all, Lieutenant. As you know, I am always willing to cooperate with the authorities in anything at all. Anything at all. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> it isn't getting any cooler, Perez. No, senor. As you see, the streets are nearly deserted this time of day. Everyone seeks refuge from the heat. Yeah. I noticed that this street wasn't exactly crowded. Hey, here's a doorway. Let's get out of the sun a minute, eh? Of course, senor. <laughs> what do you know? What is it, senor? Wouldn't you know it? Ten degrees hotter than a turkey's bath, and some joker builds a chimney on his house. Chimney? Oh, but, senor, there are no chimneys in Panama City. No. Look out in the middle of the street. See the shadow of that building across the way? Hmm. Oh, that is no chimney, senor. Chimneys do not move. Hey, that's a man up there on the roof. See? He's got a knife. Get down, get down. Yeah. It hit the door right over your head. Yeah. Two inches lower and I'd have gotten a haircut the hard way. Yeah. Yeah. Did you get a look at him? Just a glimpse of his face. Ah, the roofs are close together in this part of the city. He could be a block away by now. Yeah. <laughs> well, senor, it would appear someone objects to your presence in Panama City. That <laughs> doesn't surprise me much. Well, come on, Perez. Let's get outfitted and start that trip up the river to San Miguel. You know, this is not exactly like boating on the Potomac, Perez. Look at that jungle. I'd sure hate to get lost in there. Oh, it is an easy thing to do, Senor Mitchell. The only trails in there are made by the Indians, and they are well concealed. You uh, say the Indians in this area are hostile? Most of them. 
There isn't any intrusion on what they consider their country. And, of course, the Indians are not the only danger in there. No? There are always the snakes. Snakes? Oh, yes, senor. This jungle is full of them. Mm. Many varieties, but most of them are quite deadly. Oh, fine. <sighs> well, we should be getting close to San Miguel. We have but a few more hours of daylight, and because of the rocks, it is very dangerous to navigate the river at night. Well, I'm not hankering to be out in this stuff at night. These mosquitoes don't help things either. Mitchell, someone is shooting at us from the jungle. Get down in the boat. You see where it came from? See where it came from? I can't even see where we're going. We must keep control of the boat. Yeah. As soon as he shoots again, I'll take a quick look over the side and see where we're going. Hey, that went right through the boat. Look, Perez, it doesn't matter where we're going. This boat's a death trap. I think we'd better slip over into the water on the other side of the boat here. We'll be a little more sheltered that way. See, si, senor. Look out. Huh? That rock ahead of us. Yeah, get clear. Get clear. Get clear. Oh, the boat is done for. Into the water. Okay. Yeah. Perez. Perez, where are you? Right here, sir. You okay? Me. Try to swim underwater. Head for the other bank. Perez, where'd the slug hit you? In the shoulder. Here. Let me get my arm under you. Mitchell, don't try to save me. You are making a target of yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here. Okay. Yeah. Get my arm under you now. But, Mitchell... Shut up and relax. I'm going to try to go behind this rock. Yeah. Oh. Senor, I, I am getting weaker. Hold on, Perez. Just a little longer. There. We made it. Good. This rock will shelter us from Trigger Boy for the time being. How you doing, Perez? Oh, I, I'm afraid I've lost quite a little blood, senor. Well, wad up your shirt and hold it over the wound. See? Yeah, yeah, yeah that's it. Hey, I can touch bottom here. Look, just lay over on my shoulder and I'll carry you out of the water. All right. Here we go. We're going to be exposed for a second or two, but we can't help it. There. I don't think he can spot us in this underbrush. How far do you think we are from this village of San Miguel? Oh, it can only be a mile or two. Good. Okay. Come on, get up on my back now. Oh, no, senor. Please do not try to carry me. Leave me here and send help for me. Oh, fine. I'm sure the snakes around here would love to see you. But you cannot carry me all that way. Well, I'll admit playing piggyback with a sniper after us isn't my idea of fun. But at least we've got the river between us. Come on now. Here, up you go. Yeah. <laughs> Can you see the village yet, Perez? See, si. it is in that clearing just ahead. Good. This is sure the longest mile I've ever walked in my life. Yeah, I see it now. Hey, hmm? all the huts are up on stilts. It's for his building. Uh-oh. Looks like we've got a reception committee coming towards us. The man in front, I think he is their chief. We had better stop here at the edge of the clearing. Okay. Oh. I'll... Put you down here. Yeah. There. Can you stand all right? Yes. I think so. Senor Mitchell, yeah. for bringing me to safety, I... Gracias, senor. Here they come. Silencio! What you want, senores? Some help for my friend here. And some information. You come as friends? Yes. Believe me, Chief, we're in no position to do harm to anyone right now. Right. See, si. Have that one's wound cared for. See, si. Can you walk, senor? See, si. Come with me. I'll check with you in a couple of minutes, Perez. See, si, senor. Thank you, Chief. What do you want to ask me, senor? Chief, a friend of mine was killed near here a few days ago. His name was Thorne, Bill Thorne. I remember him. Well, he came to see you? Si, senor. Why? He wanted to ask me about mystery of San Miguel. Mystery of San Miguel? Well, I guess he got killed trying to find out what that mystery was. I've uh, taken over for him. 
Now, what can you tell me about it? Two, three years ago, hmm? 20 of my best men walk into jungle. Hmm? Disappear. Never see again. They disappeared without a trace? See, si, senor. Oh, why did they go into the jungle? White men offer them job working for him in mine in jungle. A mine? You know who the white man was? No, senor. Is the mine around here anywhere? See, si. He's down river not far from here. But mine is deserted. Look, would you furnish me a guide who could take me to that mine? See, si. I will send Blas. He is the best man I have. Thanks, chief. I'd like to start right now. I'd hate to be trying this alone, Blast. You can't even see these trails from ten feet away. See, si, senor. We keep them well concealed. We do not wish enemies to use them. You uh, have any idea what kind of work these men from your village were doing at this mine we're heading for? No, senor. Once I saw some of them going down river on a large boat. Could you see what was on the boat? Big boxes. Big boxes, huh? Yeah, that could have been the weapons. Aye, here we are, senor. What? Here's the mine. Where? I don't see anything. Right over there, senor. Hmm. Is that it? See. Si. <laughs> no wonder I couldn't see it. It's all blown over with underbrush. <laughs> sure haven't been operating for a long time. There, I'll take a look. Hey, the shaft's completely caved in. No chance of finding out what's down there now, I guess. Senor. Huh? The birds. What? We are being followed. What? Are you sure about that? I am sure. What was that? Stand still, senor. Uh, now I see him. Who? Look, over against that tree. Holy smoke, what's that? Iguana, senor. Ig uh, what? Iguana, a giant lizard. You call that thing a lizard? It's five feet long. Si, si. Look at him go. Si, senor. Brother, remind me never to spend a vacation here. Well, wait, wait. wait. Hmm? Birds do not stop singing for iguana. Listen. Yeah, I hear it. Someone coming through the brush. Senor, you get over behind that tree. I will lie beside the trail here with my machete. Okay. Can you see anything? See, si. he's a man. He's carrying a rifle. Probably the same sniper. Quiet. Here it comes. Uh, 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 no. Shit. Uh. Brother, you sure made short work of him, Blast. Uh, he would have made short work of us, and... Yeah. Hey, I recognize his face. That's the guy who chucked a knife at me in Panama City yesterday afternoon. You know this man? No, no, but... Here, maybe there's something here in his pockets that'll give us a lead on who he is. Uh, huh, just this picture. Picture of himself? Yeah. That girl he's with isn't bad, either. Well, come on, Blast. Let's get back to the village. Look, uh, I'm going to ask the chief if I can keep you with me to help me take Perez back to Panama City. I've got to get back there and make out my report. These reports coming in from Panama City, Commissioner. Good. Let's have it, Ruth. There you are. Great job you sent me on, Commissioner. To date, I've had a knife thrown at me, been shot at, and nearly drowned. Good luck. You know, that guy can get into trouble easier than anyone I know. Even the lizards are chasing me. He's just irresistible, I guess. Pear is wounded, but not seriously. Hmm. Located mine, which looked like promising hiding place for weapons, till I found it had been deserted for years. Here's the rest of it. I'm back in Panama City with Perez now, on our way over to the International Hotel to notify Emil Fager about the loss of his boat. We'll keep you informed. Thank you. 
We are very sorry about the loss of your boat, Senor Vega. Nonsense. It was unavoidable, Lieutenant. And I have other boats. You were both very fortunate to escape with your lives, gentlemen. You can say that again, Mr. Vega. But at least that river was cool. Where did you say this incident occurred, uh, Senor Perez? Oh, about 20 miles past your plantation, Senor. Hmm. Yes. That's bad country up there. Makes a perfect hiding place for outlaws and cutthroats. Any idea why that sniper should be shooting at the two of you, sir? Uh, no. No, none. Must have been a nasty wound you got, Senor Perez. See, my shoulder still pains, but it is much better now. Ah, uh, come on, Perez. We'd better be going. Thanks. I'll see you later, Fager. Uh, and thanks again for the use of the boat. Oh, you're quite welcome, sir. It is just unfortunate your adventure had such a disastrous ending. But do not hesitate to call on me again if you need anything. Thank you. I, uh, looked up the registration papers on the deserted mine, as you requested, Senor Mitro. Mm, what'd you find out? Well, it was owned by Manuel Carrero, and the foreman was Eduardo Avila. Mm, either of those names mean anything to you? No, not that of Manuel uh, Carrero, but I do know Avila. He has been arrested several times this last year on charges of drunkenness. He frequents the bars on the Avenida Central. Good. Let's go over there and see if we can run him down. <laughs> There is Avila, Senor Mitchell, over at the corner table with the woman. Ah, well, our luck's good, Perez, finding him in the third bar we tried. Hey, hmm? who's that girl he's with? I do not know, Senor. She's just a blue moon queen. A, a what? Blue moon queen. That is what we call them here, girls who frequent these bars and get men to buy drinks for them. Why do you ask, Senor? Because she happens to be in the picture I took out of the dead sniper's pocket. What? Are you sure of that? Take a look at it. Here. See, si, you are right. Come on. <laughs> Eduardo Avila. What do you want? As you know, I am Lieutenant Perez of the police. What has that water done? I will ask the question, senorita. I've done nothing. Were you not once the foreman of a mine up the river near the edge of the Darien country? That mine has not been operated for years. What kind of a mine was it? Why don't you leave me alone? All the time, the police, they arrest me, lock me up. Why don't you leave me alone? All I want is to be left alone. Avila, come back here. Let him go for now, Perez. I want to talk to the little lady here. What you want with me? Take a look at this picture. Who's that man with you? I do not know. Come on, quit stalling. I tell you, I do not know. Senorita, allow me to point out, if you do not tell us, I will have to arrest you. I believe you are acquainted with our jail. I'm certain you would not like to return. Now, who is the man in that picture with you? Correro. What? Let's have that again. Manuel Correro. Mitchell. Yeah. Uh, thanks, senorita. Come on, Perez. Senor Mitchell, Manuel Correro was the man who was listed as the owner of that mine. Yeah. The same guy who threw a knife at me and was shooting at us in the river. I wish he'd lived long enough to fill in a few details. After you, senor. Thanks. What do you think of this foreman we just talked to, Avila? He impresses me as a man who knows something he is drinking to forget. Yeah. I wonder if he's trying to forget those 20 natives who disappeared from San Miguel. You know, all of this seems to tie into that mine. Have you still got those registration papers on it? See, si, in my office. Good. I want to take a look at them. Here are the papers on the mine, senor. As you see, Carrero is listed as the owner, Avila is foreman. But now that Carrero is dead, I'm afraid... Wait a that... minute. Hmm? What's this? Oh, uh, that is a map of the area surrounding the mine and a diagram of the mine. It is required by law to... Hey. What is it, senor? Take a look at this diagram. See? Here's the mine shaft indicated here. Hmm? The one you discovered to be caved in. Yeah. But look over here, right around the bend of the river. <sighs> Another entrance to the mine. Yeah, a side door. Look, uh, can you get me another boat? Why, of course, but... Uh, that Indian guide, Blas, is still here in Panama City, too. Senor Mitchell, you think the weapons are stored in that mine after all? I don't know. That's what I'm going back up the river to find out.
We are very near to the shore, senor. Yeah, Blas. I'm keeping the boat in as close as I can. I don't want to miss that mine entrance. We should be getting warm, according to this map. Look, there's a bend in the river just ahead. Yes, senor, I see the entrance. Well, right over there. Yeah. In the side of the river bank. Huh? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Brother, you'd never spot that in a million years unless you knew right where it is. It's all covered with underbrush. See? Okay. Tie up to that branch. We'll take a look. See? See? There. Okay, come on. Well, here we are. It's very dark in town. Yeah. I got a flashlight. I'll go first. It's a cinch this part of the mine hasn't been abandoned for years. Look at the footprints in the dirt. Wait a minute. The tunnel takes a turn to the left here. See, it is widening out a little, see. Yeah, I think... Hold it. Holy smoke. Look at that. Rifles, machine guns, grenades. The works. <laughs> well, I've got to hand it to Carrero. He picked a good hiding place. Let's have a look. Senor, look. Huh? Look on the ground there. The bones, they're all around us. Yeah. Skeletons. A lot of them. Yeah, I guess that solves the mystery of San Miguel, Blas. Twenty men from your village walked into the jungle and disappeared. Twenty men who were hired to bring the weapons here and then were killed to shut their mouths. One of those skeletons, senor. Once was my brother. I didn't know that, Blas. I'm sorry. Senor. Hmm? Somebody is in his mind with us. Well, I'll douse the light. Your light is not necessary. I will furnish the illumination. No, no. Stand quite still, both of you. Well, Emil Fager, complete with gun. At your service, Mitchell. Or should I say you are at mine? So you're the big boy in the deal, huh? I knew it was only a question of time until you discovered this entrance to the mine, Mitchell. So I thought it expedient to await you here and give you the reception you so richly deserve. Manuel Carrera was just fronting for you with the mine, huh? He was an employee of mine, and a very inefficient one, as it turns out. Ah, stay close together. I want to keep you both in the beam of my flashlight. This man, senor. Yes, boss? He is the one who killed the men of my village and my brother. That's right. He's the one, Blas. Wait, you... Stay where you are. Stand back, I see. Watch out, Blas. He'll shoot. What happens to me does not matter. Get back. Drop that machete. I avenge my dead brother. What? Throw your machete. Throw it. See? You knocked the gun out of his hand. I've got it. Oh, let go of me, Mitchell. You sure? Let go of your right. Now. Mm. You okay, Blas? See? See, this one is nothing. Just my leg. Well, this is the second time you've saved my life, Blas. I hope it's the last time. Believe me, I don't want to make a habit of it. Senor, this man Fager, it would give me great pleasure to kill him. Yes, I know how you feel. But at least he's going to be out of circulation from now on. He's out of the weapon selling business for good. Well, I guess this puts a new twist on an old saying. What is that, senor? He who lives by the sword shall perish by the machete. <laughs> oh, come on, Blas. Let's get out of here. You have just heard the first in an exciting new adventure series, Dangerous Assignment, starring Brian Dunleavy as Steve Mitchell. Dangerous Assignment is written by Bob Reif, with music by Bruce Ashley and directed by Bill Karn. Be with us next week at this time when Brian Dunleavy, starring as Steve Mitchell, will embark on another Dangerous Assignment. Fred Allen visits Bob Hope. Be sure to hear him tomorrow on NBC. You are listening to Golden Age Radio, rumble.com slash c slash g-a-r. Brought to you by g3pl.com. The makers of Camel 
Royal Cigarettes present Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Proof of cigarette mildness is in the smoking, steady smoking. Make your own 30-day camel test, the thorough test of mildness. Smoke only camels for 30 days. Enjoy camels' rich, full flavor. See how mild camels are, how well they agree with your throat, pack after pack, week after week. You'll soon see why, after all the mildness tests, camel is by far America's most popular cigarette. Here transcribed is Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Diamond Detective Agency. Diamond Detective Agency. Well? Hi, Helen. Well? Well, what? Where's the slogan? Uh, Diamond Detective Agency is enough. This week, I've decided to conduct my business on more of a refined level. Why? I need the change. I'm getting tired of defending myself. You haven't defended yourself since kindergarten. Are you forgetting the other night in your study? Rick. Now, don't give me that sweet innocence. I should have been decorated for that campaign. Weren't you? Helen. Now, you hang up, and I'm going to call you right back. Hang up. And when you answer, I expect to hear the old Richard Diamond slogan and all. Yes, Miss Asher. Bye. No, oh, women, women. Slogan. Uh, slogan. Let's see. Diamond Detective Agency. Gumshoes we sold while you wait. What's the matter with your voice? This is the old Richard Diamond. Oh, Rick. No, well, make up your mind. Mr. Diamond? Uh, hold it, Helen. Something I can do for you? Me? No. Yes, if you're Mr. Diamond. Client? I think so, dear. I haven't seen the subpoena yet. Well, I'll talk to you later. Good luck. Bye. Bye. Well, get it over with. Hire me or serve me. I beg your pardon. Just trying to second guess you. Have a seat. Thank you. My name is Stevens. Arthur Stevens. What can I do for you, Mr. Stevens? A great deal. I charge a great deal for a great deal. I'm prepared to pay you handsomely. How handsomely and for what? $500 for a quick trip to Florida. Well, that's easy. Now, what's going to make it tough? Lucius Timken. Is that a man? Yes. He'll try and stop you. How? Kill you, if necessary. Well, that statement just cost you another 250 I anticipated that. 750 then? What do I have to do? Pick up something for me. How old is she? No, this... This is an object, a very rare object. Blonde or brunette? This is an antique. You're turning into a good straight man. It's a rare European art object, worth a considerable fortune. Anything else you'd like to know, the 750 should compensate for your inquisitiveness. Why can't you just go get it? Lucius Timken. He anticipates my arrival. Why did you pick me? Reputation. I've heard I can trust you. All right, Mr. Stevens. How much of a down payment will keep you trusting me until I get back? Let's say, uh, 250 Let's say, uh, 350 and we can trust each other. It's a bargain. Only if I live long enough to spend it. <laughs> Stevens gave me some instructions, handed me the cash, and I agreed to meet him at my office early in the morning after I had returned with the item. He gave me a round-trip ticket to Miami, Florida, a wet handshake, and a smile that reminded me of a man who'd swallowed a mouthful of sour milk. Now, in my business, I expect trouble. I can usually spot it quicker than a lonesome blonde. And as I watched the door close behind Stevens, I spotted it. Trouble all over the place, and Richard Diamond up to his shoulder holster in it. I called Helen, told her I'd ship her back some oranges, went home and packed, and by two in the afternoon was on the plane heading for Miami. Stevens had instructed me to register at the plaza and wait for a man named Shelton, who was supposed to be my contact and deliver the item. I arrived in Miami, took a cab to the hotel, registered and went up to my room to take a shower and lose some of the stiffness. A half hour later, I went down to the bar to see if I could get some of the stiffness back. Is 
this seat taken? Not a bad. Climb up. Thank you. Nice and cool in here. Yeah. Can I buy you something to go with it? Thank you. A martini. A bartender. A martini for the lady. Do you uh, live here at the hotel? Yes. Do you? Just moved in. My name's Albright. Mary Albright. Richard Diamond. Hello. Hello. Staying in Miami long? Depends on the weather. Mm, Your martini. Oh, yes. Cheers. To the weather. Oh, uh, what kind of weather are we drinking to, anyway? Sun, rain, any kind of weather, as long as there's something to do. Then let's drink to something to do. What do you do, Mr. Diamond? Oh, start by asking attractive blondes to call me Rick. All right, Rick. What do you do? Oh, make a few bucks. Work when I have to. Enjoy a cool drink in a bar with a girl named Mary. Mary? Not a bit. Have you made the trip yet? Once. Didn't like the weather. Why don't you buy me dinner, Rick? Oh, sorry you said that. Another date? Hmm, business. Then I've got to get right back to New York. Well, it was a nice idea. The nicest. Well, i got to be going. Nice meeting you, Rick. Goodbye, Mary. Rick? Yeah? What's the weather like in New York? Cold when I left. If you ever fly up, give me a call. I'll do then. Maybe we can melt some snow. She could have melted an ice floe in the Arctic. I left her sitting at the bar looking lonesome, went back up to my room and enjoyed myself by running into the walls until I got tired and lay down to rest. I must have dozed because when I came out of it and looked at my watch, it was nearly eight. My contact was overdue, so I sat up, smoked a camel, and by eight I called the desk. Uh, hello, this is Mr. Diamond. Has anybody been asking for me? Are you sure? Okay. Oh, well, it's about time. Close the door. Hey. Close it. Look, look, friend, you better... Listen. Go to La Granada. Look, you're hurt. La Granada. Hey. Oh, why does everybody pick my room to die in? He was lying on his back with his eyes open and staring up at the ceiling. I rolled him over and wondered how far he'd travel with a bullet hole on his back. He was heavy set, wearing a navy pea jacket and dungarees. The identification in his wallet showed him to be my contact, George Shelton, and his ship was the Rio Queen. I searched him for something that looked like a rare antique, but the sailor was bare, so I sat down and made up my mind. He'd said something before he died. La Granada. I thought about the rest of the money I was going to be out if I didn't bring the antique back to Stevens and call the police. In ten minutes, Lieutenant Breek of Miami Homicide was looking at my license. Richard Diamond. 180, licensed in the state of New York, brown hair and the loveliest blue eyes. I can read. Yeah, but that description doesn't do me justice. You're a pretty fresh guy. I was influenced by the Florida propaganda. Well, you're out of your territory. You don't carry any weight down here. Uh, maybe if I ate a big dinner. I think you should know I don't like private cops. Hmm? I'm glad I have your confidence. You uh, see he just staggered in here? That's right. Ever see him before? No. You weren't expecting him? No. You called the desk and wanted to know if anybody had asked for you. I always do that to get lonesome. What are you doing in Miami? Spying. I was hired by a California orange grower. You know something? Occasionally. I feel like slapping you around. Well, don't decide on it. I get nasty. You're in trouble here. Oh, call Walt Levinson, 5th Precinct Police, New York. He'll give you references. I'll do that, but I still want to know why this guy picked your room to die in. All right, all right, I'll tell you. I flew all the way from New York just to confuse you. Yeah? Yeah. I haven't killed a man in a hotel room in years. I'm the compulsive type. I just couldn't help it. I think I'll lock you up. Well, do that, and I'll be out in an hour. And I'll sue you for so much false arrest, you'll be pounding a beat so far they'll have to pipe orange juice into you. Look, there's been a murder. 
Well, I didn't do it. The victim died in your room. You'll have to stick around for questioning. Then question me. There's plenty of time. You look like the type that breeds trouble. Yeah, I took it up after I lost my mink business. I'm going to let you run around for a while. If you're mixed up in this kid, I'll find out about yeah, it. Let me know when you do. You'll be the first to hear about it. I watched while the cleanup boys hauled away my dead contact. Then I promised Lieutenant Breek I'd meet him at the Miami Homicide Division at 8 o'clock the next morning. They left, and I waited until I was sure they were clear of the hotel, then went out to find something or someone called La Granada. Out on the street, I decided a cab driver was my best bet. I spotted one about halfway down the block and started for it. I never made it. Hold it. Right there. Oh, give me one good reason. This gun in your back? Hmm, I'm glad you said that. I was going to be brave. Don't. Who'd know you were brave if you did? Oh, what do I have to do to stay alive? Just be good and get into that car. Okay. Where are we going? <laughs> what difference does it make? Well, I might like to look at the scenery. Oh, I hate to disappoint you. <clears throat> See, Mr. Diamond? Doesn't make any difference now, does it? Before we continue with Richard Diamond, here's an important question. Will camels agree with your throat? Here's what noted throat specialists reported in a famous coast-to-coast 30-day -coast camel test. Hundreds of men and women, people in different climates, people with normal throats, smoked only camels for 30 days. The specialists made weekly examinations of their throats, 2,470 examinations in all, and reported not one single case of throat irritation due to smoking camels. Will camels agree with your throat? Make your own 30-day camel test, the sensible, thorough cigarette test. Enjoy Camel's rich, full flavor for 30 days. See how mild camels are, pack after pack. How well they agree with your throat, week in and week out. You'll make Camel's your steady smoke. For mildness, for flavor, for constant smoking enjoyment. How mild, how mild, how mild, how mild, how mild can a cigarette be? Make the Camel 30-day test and you'll see. Smoke Camel's and see. And now, back to Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. He'd sap me behind the ear with the barrel of his big gun, and I went down like a block of cement in a well. I don't know how long I stayed on the floor of the car, but when I finally pulled myself out of it and shook the cotton out of my head... I found I was in a room sitting in a chair, looking up at the biggest stomach I'd ever seen. Suddenly, over the stomach, a large, round, red face appeared. It smiled, and I tried to return the courtesy. Feeling better, Mr. Diamond? Well, I, uh, I haven't felt. Martin. Yes, Mr. Timken. Get Mr. Diamond a drink. Right away, Mr. Timken. Now, let me find my head first. I wouldn't know where to pour it. I don't generally resort to violence. Uh, but this time you made an exception. It was necessary. I shouldn't want you to find this place again. I shouldn't want to. What happens when I leave? That depends on how much you care to tell me while you're here. There's your drink. Thanks. What happened to that big gun, Sonny? Oh, would you like to see it? Not especially. Oh, how long did it take you to water this thing? I'm sorry. I didn't know you were a heavy drinker. Not heavy, just determined. Enough levities. Let's get down to business, Mr. Diamond. What kind of business, Mr. Temkin? Do you know who I am? I was warned. Then we understand each other. Where is it? What? Oh, don't be absurd. The white cow. Have you tried the stockyards? Do you insist in this humor? Only if it gets a laugh. Mr. Diamond, I intend having the white cow. Why? Has butter gone up again? I know Mr. Shelton came to your hotel room earlier this evening. Yeah, yeah. He brought a bullet along with him. We were able to catch him just after he landed, but he eluded us. And Sonny tried to slow him up with his forty-five. Well, shall we say he met with an unfortunate 
accident. Somewhere between this accident and your hotel room, he deposited the white cow. Where, Mr. Diamond? He didn't mention it. I'll give you $1,000 for the information. I'd love it, but I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, come, come. Martin followed you all the way from New York. Mm, good for Martin. He should have been a boy ranger. Look, Martin. You... Plenty of time for your talents. 2000 Mr. Diamond. For 2000 I'd sell you my grandmother's bridge work, but I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, well, Martin? Yes, Mr. Timken? Go turn on the radio. Get some music. Yes, Mr. Timken. Oh, I really don't feel like dancing. I'm still a little dizzy. 3000 Last offer. Charming, but I'm at a loss. Indeed you are. Martin? Yes, sir. Sonny going to get rough? Where is the white cow? Sorry. Change his mind, Martin. Certainly. Now, look, I... <coughs> the white cow, Mr. Diamond. I tell you, I don't know where... <coughs> the white cow, Mr. Diamond. I don't know. <coughs> where is it, funny man? You... You can go to... <coughs> where? No. <coughs> where? <coughs> really, Mr. Diamond? Is it worth it? Uh, no. I wish you thought so. Just tell me where it is. I don't know. All right, Martin. Oh, Lord. <coughs> Maybe he's telling the truth. Maybe Shelton didn't tell him where he put it. And then he's of no use to us. But then again, maybe Mr. Shelton did tell him. Mr. Damon. Uh, he's an obstinate young man. Oh, I'll change that. No, you might kill him. If he does know, he can still lead us. Put him to sleep and deposit him in some alley. Yes, sir. <coughs> like taking a ride on a loose rocket. There was a burst of fireworks, and everything seemed to drop out from under me. This time, I went up, turning round and round and trying to hang on. Then the lights were gone, and I was sailing through the darkness, wishing I was someone else. Finally, the rocket slowed down and started to fall, and I slept and went off on my own. Just a poor, tired, beaten up little private detective looking for some place to land. When I came out of it, I found myself sitting in an alley. I thought about all my aches and the money Temkin had offered me. I pulled myself up and thought about the miserable 750 I was getting from Stevens. Then I staggered out in the street and thought about going to some quiet rest home and turning myself in for an idiot. I spotted a cab and hailed it. Uh, take me to the... Uh... Oh. oh, good evening, Miss Albright. You don't have an old quart of plasma on you, do you? The world happened. Oh, nothing in the world. I was jumped by three saucers. Here. Let me help you in. I'm afraid you'll have to. I was just on my way to the hotel. Go ahead, driver. I had the driver pull over when I saw you. What in heaven's name happened? Oh, I was just washing dishes. Honest, honest I was. It's those, those new garbage disposals. Well, if you don't want to tell me. Let's take the swelling out of my head first. I'll get you right up to your room. Uh, no, no, let's use your room. I don't want to explain this to Lieutenant Brake. Lieutenant Brake? Narrow-minded cop. Would never believe the story about the disposal. Put your head on my shoulder. Which one? This one. I mean, which head? This will sting a little. Put it on the numb spots, hmm? Mm. I'm sorry. Well, I'll be right home, Mom. Oh, you're not hurt that bad, Rick. Would you be satisfied with, uh, shall we say, a corpse? You're going to be all right. No, oh, yeah, but I'm going to need nursing. I'd love it. Exactly the way I feel. <sighs> you going to tell me about it? <sighs> I, I can't. Secret? Mm-hmm. Just what kind of work do you do? Whatever it is, I'm underpaid. You must make a lot of enemies. I try. Thought you were going back to New York tonight. I nearly did. In a crate. Hey, uh... What's the matter? Have you ever heard of, uh, La Granada? La Granada? In New York? 
No, no, here in Miami, I think. No. What is it? I don't know, but I've got to find it. You ask anyone? I've been too occupied. How about the phone book? Now, isn't that just like a woman, always being practical? Well, it's just a suggestion. Hmm. One that might make me look even more stupid than I am. Have you got a book? I'll get it. Granada. Granada, La. Granada. There are two of them. What are they? Restaurant on Opal and a hardware shop on James. Mm, well, it's, uh, it's 11.30. I'll try the restaurant first. Can I go? Uh, sorry, no, no. You've got to stick around with the iodine. I might be back for a nightcap. The two Granadas in the phone book didn't seem like a place the dear Mr. Shelton would leave an antique, but I went up to my room, put on a clean shirt, and went downstairs to grab a cab. As I started to crawl in, a large arm shoved its way in front of me. Lieutenant Breek was on the other end. You've been busy. Idle hands, you know the old saying, Lieutenant. Where to now? To blow up the city hall. Want to come along and hold the bomb? Look, Diamond, I'm keeping score. I've been checking on the guy who died in your room. He got off the Rio Queen all right, but not when he ducked. Some guy named Samson picked him up in a small boat about five miles out. Evidently, he didn't like customs. Evidently. It's an old habit of his, I found out. Two previous arrests for smuggling. What does Samson have to say about it? Nothing. He's too dead to say anything. Uh-huh. Well, it's nice talking to you informally like this, Lieutenant. Now give me a parking ticket or let me get in the cab. Got a date? Yeah. You ought to check up on the people you've been keeping company with. Another beating like that and we'll have to put you in Brian. Yeah, I think how horrible I'd look. Then you could tell everybody I was your twin. <laughs> I got out of the cab a half block from the La Granada restaurant and did everything but walk backwards to look like I wasn't going there. I looked the place over and went in. It was just closing and a little balding man with an accent walked over to me. Uh, I'm sorry, but the kitchen is closed, senor. Uh, that's all right. I'm looking for the white cow. Uh, Perdoni? The white cow. I, I, I don't believe... A man that. named Shelton left it here for me. Sh Shelton... White cow? Shelton's a seaman off the Rio Queen. The Rio Queen? Yeah, he told me he left the white cow here. Gee. Well, senor, you can look around, but you can bet me we got no white cow. Uh, it's an antique. Okay. Yeah, what? what? Uh, the white cow, a very rare antique. <laughs> you uh, been in a fight, huh, senor? Yeah, now, now, now. You got, got hit on the head pretty hard, huh? You haven't got it. Oh, you? Sure. You have? Sure. We got a white cow and a blue cow right out in the kitchen. We're going to have both of them for breakfast. Okay. okay. Only I don't think I could show them to you. They don't like strangers. So that took care of the first bet. As I walked out of the restaurant, I made up my mind. If the hardware shop didn't pay off, I was going to get back to New York and hibernate for the winter. The La Granada hardware shop was all the way on the other side of Miami on a dark street that looked like the inside of a coffin. Evidently, nobody was interested in buying any hardware at midnight because it was closed. I banged on the front door for about 10 minutes, and then, as I was just about to give up, I saw a light and the door opened a crack. Yeah? Uh, Shelton sent me. Beat it. Hey, what do you think you're doing? Now, listen, listen. A guy named Stevens sent me to meet a guy named Shelton. Shelton was supposed to give me something called the white cow, but Shelton died. What? Yeah, and while he was doing it, he said, La Granada. Now, if this is the place, say so. I'm running out of nerves. Bill's dead? Oh, you know him. He's my brother. Shut the door. You've got the white cow? What's your name? Diamond. Yeah. Bill said you'd be by. He led me to the back of the shop, and I watched while he reached into a bin of ten penny nails. He fished around and pulled out a small, square-shaped object wrapped in oil skin. As he turned to hand it to me, he froze. Don't move. Who's this guy? Oh, oh his name's Martin. He likes to beat guys up. I'm not going to beat you up this time, Diamond, but you shouldn't have lied to Mr. Timken. I'm going to have to kill you for it. This is probably the guy who killed your brother. Yeah. Give me the package. Sure. Toss it. Stay right there. You killed Bill, huh? You didn't tell him enough about me, Diamond. Uh! Uh! Now you're gonna get yours, funny man. Well, well, 
Miss Albright. You do everything well, don't you? I try. Get the package over here, Rick. Mr. Diamond. Oh, now you're mad. You don't resent it, do you? No. Kick it over here. Thanks. Now, now, I see. Pick me up in the bar, wait outside that alley. And if you knew I was in that alley, you must know the people who put me there. Mr. Timken and I are old friends. He's not going to like you killing Sonny. Won't make a bit of difference to him. No? You kill him too? Yes. This package is worth about a half a million dollars. An antique? It's what's in the antique. You buy it in China for about a thousand dollars. You refine it here and sell it for 500 times that much. The federal government won't like it. Who's to tell them? Certainly not Stevens. He contracted to smuggle the stuff in. Everybody else is dead. But me... Sorry about that. I was beginning to like you. Oh, but uh, not a half million dollars worth. No. Drop it, ladies. Well, Don't do it. <laughs> Looks like Grand Central. I'm glad nobody locks doors around here. How did you find me? I told you I was keeping score. <sighs> hey, you better get an ambulance, Lieutenant. I wish she hadn't tried to shoot. <sighs> here. Lean on me, dear. It's the least I can do. The gun will probably be the one that killed this Timken guy. Get the ambulance, will you? Yeah. Rick. Yeah. Looks like nobody gets anything. I got 350 in the beating. I guess I come out on top. Sorry. Won't be able to come to New York. So am I, Mary. There's gonna be a lot of snow this year. Dick Powell will return in just a minute. A few years ago, 113,597 doctors were asked what cigarette they smoked. The brand named most was Camel. Again and again, a cross-section of America's men of medicine were asked the same question. Every time, the brand named most was Camel. Yes, according to these repeated surveys, more doctors smoke Camels than any other cigarette. How mild, how mild, how mild can a cigarette be? Smoke camels and see. Here's Dick Powell with a special message. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, nobody deserves our appreciation as much as the hospitalized men and women of our armed forces. As a token of appreciation, the makers of camels send them gift cigarettes every week of the year. This week's camels go to Veterans Hospitals, Fort Meade, South Dakota, and Washington, D.C. U.S. Army Station Hospital... Fort Hood, Texas. U.S. Naval Hospital, Yokosuka, Japan. Now until next week, enjoy camels. I always do. Tonight's transcribed adventure of Richard Diamond was written and directed by Blake Edwards with music by Frank Worth. Virginia Gregg played the part of Helen Asher. Others in the cast were Sidney Miller, Ted DeCorsia, Tony Barrett, Alan Reed, Herb Butterfield, and Tony Michaels. Be sure to listen to another great camel show, Vaughn Monroe and the Camel Caravan, every Saturday night. Men, pack your pipes with Prince Albert, America's largest selling smoking tobacco. PA's choice tobacco is crimp cut for smooth, even burning, and specially treated to ensure against tongue bite. The bite's out, and the pleasure's in. The bite is out, and the pleasure's in. When you smoke Prince Albert, it's specially treated not to bite your tongue. The bite is out, and the pleasure's in. Listen next week for another exciting adventure of Richard Diamond, starring Dick Powell. You are listening to Golden Age Radio. Rumble.com slash C slash G-A-R. Brought to you by G3PL.com. Calling all adventure fans. Calling all Dick Tracy fans. Stand by. Dick Tracy is on the air.
the makers of Quaker Puffed Wheat and Quaker Puffed Rice, those two tasty, nourishing cereals that are shot from guns, now bring you another thrilling Dick Tracy adventure. And there's the sound of the big guns in the Quaker plant, where they're making puffed wheat and puffed rice for the thousands of happy families who enjoy something specially good for breakfast every day. You know, breakfast is a very important meal. It follows the longest stretch between meals and comes just before you start your active day. That calls for lots of real food energy. And that, in turn, calls for nourishing puffed wheat and puffed rice. That's why they're shot from guns. A special Quaker process explodes each grain of wheat and rice to eight times its normal size. The tiny, hard-to-digest food cells are unlocked for you so that you can use their trigger-fast food energy easily and quickly. So have Quaker puffed wheat or Quaker puffed rice for breakfast often. Try them turn about. Puffed wheat one day, puffed rice the next. You know, there's a good idea for you to tell Mother about. She's always trying to give you and Dad something different that you really enjoy and that's specially good for you, too. Well, with Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice, you have two delicious flavors for a taste variety that the whole family goes for. So tell Mother about it and ask her to get some Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice at the grocer's. And then you can change flavors every day and still be getting the trigger-fast food energy you need to be as quick in thought and action as Dick Tracy is. And remember, patrol members, there's another secret code message for you at the end of today's program. So be sure you have your pencil, paper, and secret code book ready. An unknown assailant called the man with the yellow face has threatened the life of the well-known Egyptologist, Dryden Small. Yesterday, we heard how Dick had received a code message from Pat, who was walking on Deck A with Dryden Small. As Dick and the ship's captain hurried to Deck A, someone cried, Man overboard! It seems Pat, fighting hand-to-hand with the man with the yellow face, had been thrown overboard. The brave and courageous detective leaped over the side after his friend. Will he save him, or will he, too, meet death in the black waters of the ocean? Get my boat more on the side. All right, sir. Station four. Station uh, four. The Apache just went in after Pat. Hey, what? Come along, man. We've got to get that lifeboat over the side at once. It's being loud now, sir. Good, good. Come along. Come along. Easy in the mouth, eh? Steady. Keep a level as you know it. Spot the men. Spot Larry. There are two men on the board. Please, sir. Cover those blocks far enough. And the old men. Good luck, men. Good luck. You've got to bring them back. Uh, thank goodness they're keeping their searchlights going. Right, sir. I don't see. Hold on, sir. There's something to port. Two points in the port bow, sir. This way. Help. Help. That's Tracy and Pat. Pull out, men. Right, sir. Inside of them. Keep away there. Steve, boys. Steve. Uh, Stand by in the bow, bosun, to help him board. Aye, aye, sir. Oars. Yeah. All right, Mr. Tracy. We've got you, sir. We've got you. Take Patton. He's out. Right, sir, right. Pull him in, boys. Pull him in. Uh, now, lend him a hand. Here we are. Uh, uh, all right, you're next, Mr. Tracy. Grab hold, sir. Grab hold. Yeah. Easy. Uh, up you come, sir. Up you come. Over. Uh, thanks. There we are. Uh, well, that water's cold. How's Pat? Hey, he'll be all right, Tracy. He's suffering from cold and shock, most likely. But we'll get him back to the ship at once. And pull away together. Stroke. 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 Well, Dick, I guess I owe my life to you once again. Someone else would have pulled you out if I hadn't been there, Pat. Uh, but no one else did. That's the point. Now that you're able to talk, Pat, tell me, what happened up there on deck? Well, Small and I noticed someone whom we took to be the man with the yellow face. Uh-huh. I immediately sent you that message asking you to come up on deck. Well, after the steward left with the message, Small and I walked aft along deck A when suddenly a figure slipped out of the shadows. He was honest before I could get set. Mm. He knocked Small to the deck and then I grappled with him. Dick, I, I've never met anyone so powerful in all my life. I couldn't do a thing against him. He was so strong that he actually picked me up bodily and heaved me overboard. Mm. I don't suppose you got a good look at him, Pat. No, Dick, I, I didn't. Everything happened so quickly. This man, Dryden Small, he knows why he's being hounded, Pat. He knows what the man with the yellow face is after. And I'm convinced he also knows who the man with the yellow face is. Well, why don't we just wash our hands of the whole matter, Dick? Oh, now, you know we can't do that, Pat, even though I told Small I would. But there's something I can do. 
I can have this out with Dryden Small. So far, we've managed to protect him, but we can't go on this way. We've got to make that fellow realize that the closer we get to America, the more desperate our adversaries will become. Come on, we might as well have this out right now. I remember the doctor said he was sleeping. I can't help that. I wonder who that is. Come in. Well, Captain, come in. I don't mean to disturb you, Mr. Tracy, but something terrible has happened. Well, what is it, Captain? The thing I've been dreading has come at last. You recall earlier this evening I spoke of one of the crew being found unconscious in the storage room. He was a man with a weak heart, I said. Yes, yes, I remember. He's the man who claimed to have seen a figure standing in the door of the storage room. Yes, well, he insisted on going on with his work in the storage room. He's had another shock, Tracy. One that may be fatal. Another heart attack? Yes. From what I know, I, I'm convinced he was scared into his present state. I see. Where's the victim now? He's still down in the storeroom. The doctor is giving him first aid, trying to revive him. Pat, you stay with Dryden Small. Yeah? I'm going down to that storage room with the captain. Those two things may be linked up. I don't know how, but they may be. Okay, Dick. But don't worry about me. I'll be all right. Here, uh, take my gun. You may need it since you lost yours overboard. All right, thanks. And don't let Small out of your sight. Oh, I won't. Come along, Captain. Right. If what you say is true, we may have to make new plans at once to trap the man we're looking for. Well, Doctor? He's still in the deep coma, Captain. I haven't been able to do a thing for him. I'm afraid he must be taken to the ship's hospital. Oh, very well, Doctor, very well. I've already sent for a stretcher. Splendid. Give him the best of care. I tell you, Tracy, it, it was something the man saw. Captain, may I suggest that your men make a thorough search of the hold at once, especially the storage room? I've already seen to that, Tracy. What you told me this evening about the strange apparition this man saw may certainly have something to do with this. Perhaps it was the man with the yellow face. By the way, what... What's that thing over there? You're there? <laughs> That's the mummy case Dryden Small is bringing back to America. I believe it contains the mummy of Tadonkamal's second son. Frankly, Tracy, I'd feel much happier if Tadonkamal never had a second son. Yes. A mummified passenger isn't altogether pleasant. Uh, what I'm worried about is the effect of all this on the crew, Tracy. They talk a great deal. Too much, perhaps. Rumors get around, you know. Before you know it, your ship has a bad name. I, I don't like it. I can well understand that. Ah, here comes the mate. Have you found anything? No, nothing, sir, not a thing. The men are still going over everything, though, just to be sure. Ah, thank you. Well, Tracy, there doesn't seem to be much either of us can do here. Would you care to join me in my cabin? A little coffee, perhaps? Some sandwiches? Yes, I'd enjoy it very much. But I feel the most important place for me to be right now is back in Dryden Small's cabin. All right, I'll have the coffee sent there. Hey, Dick, sir. This way, Captain. Dryden Small's stateroom is down this way. Yes. You know, Tracy, it certainly is reassuring to have you on board this trip. I'd hate to have all these bizarre things happening without you here to help clear them up. Well, I haven't cleared them up, Captain. No, but I know your reputation. I have absolute confidence in you, Tracy. Well, thank you. This is really one of the most puzzling cases I've ever encountered. Mm -hmm. I don't believe I ever had so little of a tangible nature to work with. There's so many things I'd like to know... I'd give a great deal, for instance, to know what the black pearl of Osiris is and where it is. I'd like to know why the man with the yellow face is so anxious to get hold of it. To make it brief, Captain, I, I'd like to know what it's all about. Mm, that is all that, eh? Well, I'll say this, Tracy. I'll be a very much relieved man when this ship docks at New York. I dare say. Well, here we are. Mm -hmm. ah, Pat must be in the bedroom. Yes, he, uh... I have told you this before. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Voice, strange voice. Listen. I have no desire to discuss this matter with you at any length. All I ask from you is that you tell me where the Black Pearl is. The Black Pearl of Osiris. I don't know, I tell you. I don't even know what you're talking about. Your friend, Ryden Small, practiced the same deception. He, too, pretended ignorance of the Black Pearl of Osiris. You see what has happened to him. The same thing will happen to you. This pearl-handled revolver of his may not be very impressive looking, but I rather think if it is well aimed and uh, skillfully handled, it can be deadly indeed. Now listen, I'm telling you. You that will I... tell me nothing but what I want to know. Where is the black pearl of Osiris? Answer you, white devil, or it will be the worse for you. Great heavens, Tracy! What? What's going on in there? It's evident that Pat's on the spot. I've never heard that voice before, but I'll bet it's the man with the yellow face. What can we do? 
Have you a gun? No, I haven't. Neither have I. I gave mine to Patton. I can get one, though. No, there's no time. We've got to work quickly. But you can't do anything against that man without a gun? Time grows short, my friend. Answer me quickly. I refuse to waste further words with you. Now, listen. I'm telling you the truth. Why should I lie to you? I don't know where the black pearl you're talking about is. This little pearl-handled revolver is about to speak. I do not think you would care to hear its voice. Now, I tell you, you've got me all wrong. I don't know any more about that black pearl than you do, or Tracy does. We tried to get dry and small to tell us, but he wouldn't. Very well, my friend. I see you are not only stubborn, but reckless of your life. And so it Ready, becomes Captain. necessary anything, for anything. anything. To what are you going to do? Pull a bluff, Captain. Pull a bluff. To kill you. And believe me, my friend, you could have avoided it if you had wanted to. However, you forced my hand. And so... Dick! Dick! There you are. Drop that gun or I'll drop you. Who is the man with the yellow face? And will Tracy succeed in bluffing him? What is the mystery of the Black Pearl of Osiris? We'll soon know. But now the makers of Quaker Puffed Wheat and Quaker Puffed Rice, those two delicious nourishing cereals that are shot from guns, invite you to attend the meeting of the Dick Tracy Secret Service Patrol. And here's Dick Tracy, Jr., your patrol president now. The 21st meeting will now come to order. And today I have another secret code message for you patrol members. So get your pencil and paper ready, fellows and girls. You know, one reason why we're sending you these secret messages every day is that Dick Tracy wants you to be able to use the code as easily and as quickly as he does. That's important. And that's why you should send at least one code message to every patrol member you know every day. That's the way to get good at it, and it's a lot of fun. But now, get ready for today's secret message from Dick Tracy. Here it is. It's football. 10, 11, 7, 17, 11, 26. 17, 9, 12, 25. 5, 17, 6, 15. 11, 25, 13, 3, 26. Did you get it? Repeat it, Junior, to make sure. Okay. Here you are. It's football. 10, 11, 7, 17, 11, 26. 17, 9, 12, 25. 5, 17, 6, 15. 11, 25, 13, 3, 26. And remember, fellows and girls, that's a real message from Dick Tracy to you. Follow those instructions because something very important is about to happen. And if you or any of your friends are missing all the fun we're having, tell them how to join the patrol right away. You know, you just mail two Quaker Puff Tweet or Quaker Puff Rice box tops or one of each with your name and address to Dick Tracy, Box L, Chicago. Then you're a full-fledged member. You get the secret code book, the Dick Tracy Pledge, and the patrol member's badge. And don't forget to form your own active Dick Tracy patrol. It tells you how to in the secret code book. And then you're a patrol leader, and Dick Tracy sends you the special patrol leader's badge to wear with your regular badge. And say, patrol members, have you been promoted to the rank of sergeant or... You are listening to Golden Age Radio, rumble.com slash c slash g-a-r. Brought to you by g3pl.com. Now, from the makers of Cold Water Omo... There is a public call box in the street outside the Ministry of Missile Redeployment... Into the call box, a char lady, dressed in the traditional clothes, made her way slowly and without fuss. She picked up the phone and dialed a number without reference to the telephone books. In another part of London, a phone rang. A man's hand, well kept, clean, with beautifully manicured nails, stretched out. On the third finger of the hand was a very distinctive ring, a design of entwined heart. The man picked up the phone. Bonville. Margaret, oh, darling. You're getting a bit hot, I'm afraid. What do you mean? They're on to Sir Rodney. The security man's dead. He's confessed. Then break contact. Throw him to the wolves. That's exactly what I've done. Good. Better call and see me sometime. Have to work out another plan. Meanwhile, you better shed that Charlie image, hadn't you?
Avengers. John Steed and Emma Peel, the Avengers. fabric conditioner that not only softens, but actually rinses out hardness, rinses in a new kind of softness. Comfort leaves your wash refreshingly young and bouncy again. Just a little comfort in the final rinse gives a lot of comfort to your wash. John Steed and Emma Peel realize that the security leak at the Ministry is no game, but the score remains. Love all. Mother knew that there was a security leak at the Missile Redeployment Department. Everyone in the department had been carefully checked and screened, but so far nothing had been discovered. Things came to a head when Metcalf, a security man, had been found dead. Sir Rodney Kellogg, head of the department, had confessed to the killing, claiming that he'd found him going through private papers, and in the subsequent struggle, Sir Rodney's gun had gone off. John Steed wasn't convinced by the story. He was sure Sir Rodney was covering up for someone else. He had Sir Rodney put under house arrest, pending a full inquiry. That night, Sir Rodney paced the floor of his office, he called to the guard at the door. A oh, guard? God, uh, uh, I wonder if it would be possible for me to see the personnel file. Uh, it's in Mr. Tate's office. Well, Sir Rodney, I, uh, I don't know. I mean... Oh, now, look here, man. I, I know you're only doing a job guarding me like this, but I can't be expected to relax. I, I might as well do a little work, too. Now, come along. Well, uh, well, I suppose it's all right. Don't see why not. I'll get it for you. The guard went away, and Sir Rodney continued his pacing. Leaving the door open, the guard returned. Uh, there you are, sir. Oh, oh, thank you. Thank you very much. The guard closed the door and said to the other guard on duty, You know, there's something rotten in the state of Denmark. Uh, that Shakespeare, isn't it? Yeah, King Lear. Just before he fights Macduff and goes mad. I uh, can't be any more mad than Sir Rodney. Bonkers, if you ask me. Had the two guards seen Sir Rodney at that point, they would have been sure of the fact. For Sir Rodney, having searched the personnel file, had found what he was looking for. Yeah, domestic, 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 domestic. Uh, uh, here we are. Martha. Martha Roberts, four Chester Place. Got it. Oh, my beloved. Now I've found your address. Wild horses can't keep you from me now. So saying, Sir Rodney flung the file down on the desk and, running the length of the room, jumped through the plate glass window. <laughs> the two guards burst into the room. Blimey! He went through the window! Uh, Twenty foot drop! He's got away! Look, there he goes! <laughs> Mother's headquarters, white wine was still the order of the day. Or night. Mm, splendid. Beautiful, Gerald. So, you don't think Sir Roddy killed Nessar, Steed? I'm certain that he didn't. Look at those. Steed produced the pearl handled revolver. He told me he had a firearms permit. Yeah, and you've checked. Nothing registered in his name. Then who is he carrying up for? 
Whoever gave him the gun, presumably. Hmm. Small, her handle. Hmm. Yes. A woman? Yes, but not necessarily. Plenty of men used to carry these in the early 19th century. Not that I hope we have to go back quite that far. Mother? Yes? What? Well, you're a couple of blizzing fatheads. Don't tell me. Sir Rodney has escaped. Right. Jumped through a window 20 feet from the ground. Now, what would make a, an aged civil servant do that? Madness? Desperation? Or love? Mrs. Peel, I have never known you so incurably romantic or so unhelpful. I'm sorry, I can't help it. And I can't help being thirsty. Open another bottle of wine. <laughs> Rodney made a clean getaway in his roles. He drove straight to number four, Chester Place. Parked outside, ran nimbly up the steps and rang the doorbell. Some little while later, the door opened. Martha stood in the doorway, but not as the grubby char lady. She looked young and beautiful. She showed no sign of recognizing Sir Rodney. In a cultivated voice, she said, Yes? Oh, I, I, I was looking for Martha Roberts. Oh, you mean my aunt? Uh, she's in the bath. Can I give her a message? Well, not really. It's personal. Ah, uh, what name shall I say? Well, just tell her it's, uh, uh, Rodders. Rodders? Yes, that's right, uh, Rodders. She'll know who that is, will she? Oh, yes, yes, uh, yes, indeed she will. Right. I'm afraid I can't ask you in because we're in such a mess. Auntie never receives visitors until she's had a chance to tidy up. Just wait, will you? Oh, of course, of course. Forever, if necessary. They say there's no fool like an old fool. Here's proof, all right. Inside the house, Martha made another telephone call. Rodney's got away from the ministry. He's waiting outside. What do I do? You must go to him. Can't have him blabbing everything. Keep him waiting for ten minutes, then uh, I'll be over and uh, waiting in the street. But what do I do? Dress yourself in your child ladies' outfit. Meet him. Get him to drive you to some secluded spot. In the car, perhaps. Yes, and... Dispose of him. Don't worry, Martha. I shall not be far away. It has to be done. and Emma Peel were doing a routine check on Sir Rodney's office. The guard was slightly more than crestfallen. Well, how are we to believe that any one of Sir Rodney's eyes would undertake such an escape? I mean, would you like that dump, Mr. Steed? <sighs> Not through a closed window. The point is, why not open it and shin down a drain pipe sooner than take the chance of injuring oneself? It doesn't make sense. People in love never do, as I've been trying to tell Mother. You say he asked for this file? Oh, that's right. A personnel file. Don't ask me why. If you knew, it might help. Well, I didn't see any harm in it. So, I went and fetched it. You haven't touched anything in here? Oh, no, Mr. Steed. Not a thing. We've left everything as we found it. The personnel file closed on the table. As though flung down hurriedly. He found something he was looking for. But what? Or whom? Yeah. If only we knew what sort of personnel he was looking for. All right, guard. I'll put in a good word for you. Night. <laughs> Rodney waited in Chester Street for ten minutes. During that time, a sports car drew up across the road. The hand that steered the wheel had a distinctive ring on one finger. Bromfield had arrived. He watched as the door to number four opened. Martha, as a char lady, came out. In her cockney voice, she said, Oh, Rodgers, I can't let you go. Oh, Martha, my darling, I, I escaped. Escaped? Oh, you shouldn't have done that. Oh, I know, but I, I just had to see you again. You must go back immediately. Well, out of the question. Every minute away from you is... I've been talk. looking for you. You don't want to bring me into this, do you? Ah, they'll never find us, my love. We'll, we'll disappear together somewhere far away where we can be safe. Martha, looking over her shoulder, saw the sports car and said... All right, Rodney, I'll go with you. Take me wherever you like. Oh, my darling. Oh, you made me so happy. You'll never regret this, I, I promise you. No, but you might. Never, never, I swear it. Come on, 
Sir Rodney took Martha by the hand and led her to the rolls. Seconds later, they were purring their way towards the park, followed by the sports car. At a convenient spot, Martha said, Pull up at the end of this street, please, Roger. Yes, but we have much time. Please do as I say, darling. I want to ask you something. Oh, very well, dearest. Uh, Anything you say. Kiss me, Rodney. Of course, my love. Uh, But don't you... No, but... I want you to make love to me. I want to be sure you do. Oh, you, you know I do, my darling. And you never leave me? Never, never. Martha opened her handbag and withdrew another pearl-handled revolver. Promise? I promise. Oh, what a pity. Minutes later, Martha joined Bromfield in the sports car. <laughs> I'm sorry, darling. There was no other way. Never mind. There are plenty more fish in the sea all ready for catching and flying. hard to reach cracks and crevices like around the sink. That's the sort of dirt that's hardest to shift if you don't have Vim 99. Only Vim has deep cleaning bleach to get right down into cracks and deep set stains, leaving everything really clean and germ free. For total cleanness you can trust, use Vim. Vim 99, the strong one. No dirt can stand up to the cleaning power of cold water Omo. Mrs. Whelan had to wash greasy overalls. And I thought, oh, well, I won't worry. I'll stick it into cold water either. And sure enough, every bit of grease is up. Once an OMO user, always an OMO user. The Avengers. Listen every evening, Monday to Friday, to John Seed and Emma Peel, The Avengers, brought to you by the makers of Cold Water Omo. You are listening to Golden Age Radio, rumble.com slash c slash g-a-r, brought to you by g3pl.com. Have you heard the strange tales of the Whistler? My plan is sound, mathematically sound. It cannot fail. It's perfect. Three months from now, I will be worth $50,000. Independent for life. Another Sunday night, and again CBS presents The Whistler. the whistler know many things for I walk by night I know many strange tales many secrets hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows and so I tell you tonight the amazing tale of Fool's Gold Herbert Lang is chief teller of the amalgamated bank a thrifty man of 43 Herbert has been an employee at a small salary for over 20 years Honest and punctual, his reputation is above reproach. 
Herbert is thin, slightly bald, bespectacled, and unmarried. Herbert is a poor man, but he has a plan. He won't always be poor, because he's developed his plan for ten years. And ten years should bring mathematical perfection to any plan. For five years now, it has been working. And by the first of June, three months from now, I will be worth $50,000. Herbert studies the figures on the little pad before him, writes a total of 50000 and smiles behind his bifocals. Then an abrupt sound breaks his meditation. Herbert? Huh? The auditor has just found another shortage and they've traced it. Shortage? Another? Yes. Three thousand dollars. They've traced it? Definitely. Third one this year. Uh, And to whom did they trace it, Mr. Faber? That young fellow, Barton. He denies it, of course, but the evidence is all against him. Barton, I can't understand what happens to young men lately. I do my best to hire the ones I think are on him. I wish you'd exercise a little more care. Oh, I know they have the best of references. I should think by now you'd be able to judge character at a glance. I'd have sworn by that boy, Mr. Faber. Hmm. They've taken him down to the police station. Oh, what a shame. Very embarrassing, Mr. Fabe. I feel as though I'm responsible. Oh, now, don't take it that way, Herbert. After all, we're insured. But it is annoying to both of us. We all make mistakes in judgment now and then. Besides, you had your nose to the wheel without a vacation for three years now. It doesn't pay, Herbert. You'll crack up. Well, I haven't felt as though I needed a vacation. And Besides, when I do take one, I'd like to have it all in one lump. I've... Always wanted to tour Europe or some foreign land. Or two weeks mean nothing. I understand. I feel the same way, but what chance is there? I do think you need a rest from this place. I'll let you know when I'm really tired, Mr. Faber. Hmm. I doubt it. I will say that I admire your devotion to duty. Thank you, Mr. Faber. It's good to hear you say that. I want you to know that I appreciate the opportunity of being with the firm for 20 years. Yeah. Oh, uh, there's a board of directors meeting this afternoon. I'm going to try to get you a raise. Oh, that's all right. So whatever they decide will be for the best. I wouldn't want the board to think I was dissatisfied here. You're 43, Herbert, and alone, unmarried. That isn't right. And you're not the type of man to tackle marriage on your salary. <laughs> well, I've been thinking about it. I have plans. I, I've saved a bit. I found the right woman. I, oh, Miss Faber, I, I may surprise you one of these days. Hmm. Yeah. Up into my office after the board meeting. May have some news for you. Uh, make it around three. Oh, thank you, sir. Thank you. Herbert sits at his desk, smiling. What complete confidence they have in him. What a perfect setup. Three thousand more accounted for. Three more months, and I'll have reached my goal. Fifty thousand and independent for life in South America. <laughs> With a move of sudden decision, Herbert slaps on his hat, walks out of the bank, and pays a visit to Hazel Yates at her apartment. What are you doing away from the bank at this hour of the day, Herbert? Well, I'm out to lunch. I thought I'd drop by. Oh, that's nice. I'm certainly surprised. Uh, Hazel, exactly three months from now, I'm going to take a vacation. You certainly need one. It's been ages since you've been away from your work for more than a day. Yes, I know, but I had to keep my nose to the grindstone. But now it's different. What do you mean? Well, I've kept it a secret, but now I can tell you. uh, I'm going to get married. Married? Herbert, you're going to get married. That's right. But I I thought you never considered marriage because you felt you couldn't support a wife. That's true, but now it's different. I didn't want to say anything till I was sure... What are you talking about? Hazel, for several years now, I've been working on a problem, a plan, a plan that cannot fail, because it's mathematically correct. What? I have it. You you frightened me. Uh, It it has to do with the stock market. I've worked it over and over. Stock market? Gambling? Oh, no, no, not gambling. Not the way I worked it out. (laughs) Lots of people have thought they'd found the secret to playing the market. And what happened? Well, this isn't a theoretical plan. This has already worked. Proven. Already worked? I set myself a goal, an amount of money I felt sufficient to live on, in ease for the rest of my life. Fifty thousand dollars. Beyond that sum, I would not attempt to go. Fifty thousand dollars? Yes, I've placed every dime to use, according to the plan, and I've not missed one. Herbert, you... You mean you have fifty thousand dollars? Well, not quite, but we'll have by the first of June. Well, I can't get over it. 
an amazing. Well, it's very simple. I have got 3,000 to go. And then I'm through. 3,000? Oh, that frightens me, Herbert. Why don't you be satisfied with what you have? You may lose it all in trying to get the other three. Oh, not a chance. I set myself a goal and I intend to reach it. <laughs> very well. I hope you're right. Uh, then, then I'm going on a long vacation. How long will you get? Oh, from next June on. On and on. From June on? How can you do that? I'm not going to work another day. Why should I? I'll be independent. I'm going to quit. Quit your job? Yes, and take a long trip to South America. I'm going to live there. My 50,000 there is like 200,000 here. What more could you ask for? I see. And you, you're going to get married? Yes, yes, I am. I haven't asked her yet, but I'm confident. Who, who is she? Do I know her? Yes, she's wonderful. Well, I, I wish you lots of happiness, Herbert. Uh, would you like to live in South America, Hazel? What? Well, yes, I would. Then you and I will be married June first. Oh, Herbert, you, you mean you're asking me? Yes. Now, don't say a word about this. Now, it's a secret. Don't tell a soul. Promise? Oh, yes, yes, Herbert, I promise. Oh, darling, I... I thought you were never going to ask me. Oh, I want to surprise you. I've never been so thrilled in my life. Uh, I've got to run along now, dear. I'll see you later this evening. Yes, everything is working perfectly for Herbert Lang. A ten-year plan just cannot fail. A few months from now, and he will be independent. Hazel, 50,000, and South America. After three now, the board meeting is over. Herbert steps confidently to the president's office. Well, I see the meeting's over, Mr. Faber. Yes. Yes, come in, Herbert. I, uh, talked it over with the board. They didn't seem to agree with me. Oh, no raise? I'm sorry, Herbert. Board members are rather a cold group of individuals. Oh, that's all right, Mr. Faber. I've gotten used to it after all these years. They're a very selfish lot. A whole lot of stock. Someone else does the work. They draw big dividends. That's all they're interested in. Well, I hold stock too, Herbert. Oh, I know, sir. But uh, you take a more personal interest in the employees because, well, you're an active officer. Oh, yes, of course. Yeah. Well, maybe they'll see their way clear next year. I'm certainly not one to become impatient. No, Herbert. Uh, I'll run along well, Just a minute. I haven't quite finished. Oh, no, sir? I, uh, <clears throat> had quite a session with the board... For the life of me, I don't understand one of them. What do you mean, sir? They were up in arms about that latest shortage. Oh, but I had nothing to do with that. Uh, do they think I took oh, it? Or... No, no, certainly not. But, well, they do think you are indirectly responsible. Brought up the fact that the five men you've hired in the past ten years have all been sent to the penitentiary. Oh, but how can I tell by looking at a man that they were all recommended? The board thinks you've been working too hard, Herbert. And you need a rest. What? They've instructed me to give you an extended vacation. Extended vacation? How long? Indefinitely. Effective in two weeks. Oh, but that's impossible, Mr. Faber. I just couldn't do that. Mm -hmm. well, I have a tremendous amount of special work on the books. I just couldn't attend to that in the next two weeks. The board at first wanted well, your vacation to be effective tomorrow night. Well, that's ridiculous. You know that, sir. Who else here could step in and take over in a moment's notice? I... Yeah, of course. Uh, that's true. Uh, do you think you could straighten things around in two weeks if you had special assistance? Special assistance? Oh, yes, but I won't need any help, sir. I I'll be able to handle it myself. Well, as soon as you finish, take a nice long trip. You need it, Herbert. Very well, sir. Oh, uh, yes. By the way, the board has voted you a $500 bonus. Have they? They only give a bonus on retirement. Why don't you tell me the truth, Mr. Faber? Sorry, Herbert. That's the way they feel. Nothing I can do about it. Oh, you'll uh, let me hear from you from time to time. Huh. Retired at 43. Huh. Well, good night, Mr. Faber. <laughs> The moment Herbert steps out of Faber's office, fear, a strangling, clutching fear grips him. Two weeks, two short weeks. That wasn't part of Herbert's plan. This is something he hadn't counted on. He's 2,000 short of his 50,000 gold. He'll have to let it go at that and be satisfied. And only two weeks to fix the books to cover the new $1,000 shortage. Night and day he works alone, works feverishly. Then on the tenth day, he has accomplished his plan. The book's balance. Everything is perfect. Things worked out sooner than I expected, Hazel. 
We needn't wait till June. We can be married tomorrow and sail the next day. I've arranged passage. Why so soon, Herbert? Oh, I thought we could have a regular wedding. No, no, I think we'd better leave now. Sooner the better. Oh, all right, Herbert. Whatever you say. Yes? Uh, good evening, Mr. Evans. Anything you or Mrs. Evans wish, just press the button. Uh, thank you, Stuart. I'll arrange for your deck chairs in the morning. Thank you. Yes, you're welcome, Mr. Evans. Uh, Why did he keep saying Mr. Evans? Ever? Uh, did he say Evans? Yes, Mr. and Mrs. Evans. Strange. Must have confused us with someone else. I'll put them straight in there in the morning. What did you do with the passport, Herbert? Uh, they're in my coat. Or... May I see mine? Yes, of course. Later, we'd best get along to dinner now. I always thought a person had to appear and sign his passport before an official. Oh, no, no, not always. May I see my passport, Herbert? What's wrong with you, Hazel? Please, Herbert. I'd like to see it. Very well. There you are. Herbert, why are we traveling under the name of Evans? Well, it's better that way, incognito, you know. How did you get this passport without my signing for what? it? This isn't my signature. Who signed it? Uh, that doesn't matter. I got it, eh? you better study that signature and be able to copy it when we arrive in port. <laughs> don't worry, darling. It's done this way every day. I don't believe you. You're hiding from someone, running from something. Oh, that's silly. $50,000. The stock market. What are you getting at? Now I am suspicious. Are you, Hazel? You stole that money. Stock market. Well, you never made a dime on the stock market in Aren't your life. Aren't you being a bit silly, Hazel? So this was your plan. A... Uh, Stealing from the bank and blaming others. That's what happened to my brother two years ago. That's why he was sent to jail. All right, Hazel. You're in this too now, so I'll tell you. I did have a plan and it worked. No one will ever be able to trace it to me. And I'll take care of your brother later. I've sent all the money to a man in Brazil, a man I know. Sent him several packages and asked him to hold them pending my arrival. He doesn't know what's in them. What man? Well, his name is Pedro Gonzalez. Big coffee plant outside of Rio de Janeiro. I see. You and I are the only ones who know, Hazel. Supposing I tell what I know. You'll be an accomplice. But my brother will be cleared. I told you your brother will be taken care of. The only way my brother can be compensated is to be cleared of the charge. No, is that so? And I intend to clear him, regardless of what happens to me. Hazel, you're being awfully silly about this. Uh, last call for dinner, Hazel. Come along now. I don't want any dinner. Oh. Then uh, let's step up on the top deck. Huh? Let's just talk this over. There's a lot of things you don't understand, Hazel. Uh, I, I'm sure I can explain things to your satisfaction. I certainly need some fresh air. I'm terribly sorry to have upset you like this, Hazel. <laughs> The tossing liner plows on through the darkness. The wind sings mournfully through the masts and cables. Herbert cannot sleep. Herbert is worried. His plan worked. It was perfect. They'll never trace the money to him. But Hazel presents another problem. It is morning now, 9 a.m. The steward steps up to Herbert's stateroom door. But Hazel, why don't you look at this sensibly? It isn't as though I'd done a murder. Why take on so? You aren't the first woman who discovered something about her husband. I made a mistake, and I'm sorry. It's done in the past. Now, why not look forward to the future together? Uh, yes? Uh, you rang, sir. Uh, yes, I... Well, my wife isn't feeling well this morning, steward. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, sir. I'll have something sent down, darling. Is uh, breakfast still being served, steward? Yes, sir, for a few minutes yet. Uh, then come along, please. She'd better have something light, huh? A grapefruit, coffee, and dry toast. Yes, sir. And um, how about a soft-boiled egg? Well, uh... Is she seasick? No, no, she isn't seasick. She's just emotionally upset, you know. You know how a woman uh, gets some time over nothing. Oh, yes, I know, sir. I think an egg will be nice. Very well. Grapefruit, coffee, toast. Dry toast. Dry. Oh. And an egg. Take about 15 minutes or so. Uh, here's the coffee shop, sir. You get quicker service here. Oh, thanks, Stuart. And uh, good luck, sir. What? Huh? Uh, what do you mean? Well, I married myself, and I know how it is. Women are just naturally suspicious creatures and jealous of everyone. 
jealous of your past and your future. Yes, I know. And uh, how long have you been married, sir? Uh, not long. <laughs> well, uh, she'll get over it. I'll be sorry. Get over what? Well, I just couldn't help hearing when I came to your door just now. You pardon me. I'd better get my order in. Oh, yes, it's after nine. Uh, by the way, if you're in the mood, there'll be games and contests on the after deck topside starting now. Horse races. Fifty cents a ticket if you care to gamble. I know, I know, but I don't gamble. Oh, well, then you'll find plenty of other things to keep your mind off your troubles. See you later, Stuart. Herbert steps into the coffee shop, orders his breakfast. But try as he might, he can't keep his mind off his troubles. His troubles and Hazel. He ponders over the thousands of dollars in the cork-lined waterproof package hidden in his trunk in the stateroom. Wonders of Pedro Gonzalez will meet the ship outside the harbor as planned. Fifteen, twenty minutes pass. Then... Mr. Evans! Mr. Evans! Yes, what is it? I, I... I, What's wrong with you? It's your wife, sir. It's it's your wife. What what are you trying to say? She, uh, she isn't in the stateroom. No sign of her. Well, she must have decided to walk around. No, no, no. Will you calm down, please? Look, look at this. I found this on the dressing table. A note? Let's have it. It it, it must have just happened, sir. It says... 9.10 9.10 a.m. Herbert, I cannot reconcile myself to such a situation. The very thought of being married to such a man as you sickens me to the depth of my soul. I can't go on. And don't think you will escape punishment for the suffering you've caused. Goodbye. Hazel. He's jumped over. 9.10. Just 12 minutes ago. Oh, I was a little fool. I'll, I'll phone the bridge. Give me the bridge. She was out of her mind. Bridge? Uh, stop ship. Man overboard! Man overboard! The ship leans over and puts about. They scour the choppy seas for over an hour, circling and circling. Herbert stands beside the captain, peering wild-eyed into the water. Finally, the captain gives up hope, orders the ship to resume its course, and invites Herbert to his quarters. Sit down, Mr. Evans. Thank you. Come in, steward. Yes, sir. Well, we've certainly done our best, Mr. Evans. No one can deny that. Yes, Captain, I know it. And I appreciate your efforts, but the sea is very choppy. It would be hard to find anyone. As you know, we'll have to ask a few questions. Yes, yes, I understand. This note was written by your wife at 9.10 this morning. Yes, sir. Do you recognize it as her writing? Well, of course. It's hers, all right, Captain. I checked with her passport signature. Uh, Mr. Evans, how long have you been married? Just a few days. We... We were on our honeymoon. The tone of this note indicates that your wife was terribly upset about something she had discovered. That's right. I I tried to reason with her, but she refused to see my side of it, I guess. Uh, What was she referring to in the note? I can answer that. I'm not asking you, steward. Oh. What was she referring to, Mr. Evans? Well, she was referring to another woman. She'd found out about another woman, a woman I'd known previous to our marriage. Did your wife threaten you? No. Did you threaten her? Oh, certainly not. Uh, when did you see her last? Well, it was at nine o'clock this morning. She was so upset she didn't want to go up to breakfast. I, I decided to go alone. I rang for the steward to bring her something to the room. Uh, that right, steward? Yes, sir. After the steward left, did you go on deck with your wife? Well, no, I, I left with the steward, went to the coffee shop. That's where the steward found me and showed me the note. Yes, sir. As I stepped up to the stateroom to answer the call, I heard them arguing. I heard Mr. Evans asking her to forget about the past and think of the future. Yes. And he told her he'd have me bring something down. Him and me walked along the corridor up to the coffee shop. He told me what to bring her, and I got it. And when I returned to the room, she wasn't there. I found a note on the table and ran for Mr. Evans. Then I phoned the bridge. And you didn't leave the coffee shop, Evans? Oh, I did not. Ask the coffee shop steward. Uh, are you trying to infer that I pushed my Certainly wife over Certainly that... not. Uh, we just want all the facts. We're on the high seas, you know. And this represents a court of inquiry, a uh, coroner's jury, so to speak. Uh, I see. Uh, Mr. Goodman, my first officer here, the ship's doctor, and I will make a decision. What's your opinion, gentlemen? Well, according to the steward's statement and the note, I'd say suicide. Mine is the same opinion. Very well. I agree with you. It's quite obvious that she committed suicide. Enter the findings in that manner, Mr. Goodman. Yes, sir. I'm very sorry about this, Mr. Evans. Please accept my condolences. That'll be all, gentlemen. And so Herbert, very sad, but far less worried, goes back to his stateroom to think. 
Ten days later, the sleek liner checks speed and prepares to stand off outside Rio de Janeiro, awaiting the arrival of the pilot. Dusk has fallen. The ship barely creeps along. Herbert stands at the aft port rail, a package in his hand, a cork-lined waterproof package. Many small boats bob about on the surface, moving at a snail's pace. As the first officer moves forward, Herbert speaks to him. Why are we stopping out here? Oh, we always stop at this first light to wait for the harbor pilot. Oh, oh. How much longer before we get in? Oh, we'll tie up in about an hour. Stand here for about ten minutes. Pilot's on his way out now. Uh, I see. Uh, uh, what's the name of this first light here? Oh, it's called the Cordoba Light. Thank you. Why don't you come up forward? There's nothing to see from back here. All the excitement will be up ahead. Yes, I'll go up there in a moment. Uh... What's that you have there? Huh? Oh, oh this. Camera? No, no, it, it's uh, some manuscripts. Why the oilskin wrapping? You think we might go down? <laughs> oh, no, I... <laughs> well, I guess I am a little superstitious. After all, we, we did sail on Friday the 13th. <laughs> well, I'll see you up for it. The ship comes to a dead stop, and Herbert peers over the port rail into the dusk. He scrutinizes each small craft, waiting, watching for the signal. The signal from Pedro Gonzalez. Then, after several minutes, a tiny launch approaches the ship very slowly. And just as it reaches the port quarter, a tiny red light flashes on and off. Herbert cups his hands around his eyes and focuses on the one man in the little boat. The light signals again, Pedro Gonzalez. Herbert looks up and down the deck. He grabs a little flash lamp from his pocket and gives the answering signal. Suddenly, with a swing of his arm, he tosses the waterproof package down to the water. He's got it. Good work, Pedro. The man grabs the package, and the little launch moves away and heads up the coast as the liner churns off up the harbor. Herbert smiles a smile of relief and steps briskly with self-satisfaction toward the bow. And now, three hours after docking, Herbert waits in a little waterfront cafe, waits impatiently for Pedro Gonzalez to keep the rendezvous. But Pedro is already an hour late, and Herbert has begun to worry. You would like more wine, senor? Huh? Oh... Oh, yes, please. I'll have another wine. Uh, by the way, waiter, uh, do you know of Pedro Gonzalez? Pedro Gonzalez? Say, si, senor. Oh, uh, have you seen him this evening? No, senor. Oh. Well, bring me the wine, please. I'll, I'll wait a little longer. See. Si. Buenas noches, senor. Huh? Pedro, where the devil have you been? I have been on my way. You got the package all right? See, si, I got it, Herbert. I'm sorry I'm so late. Oh, I, I was beginning to think you'd run out on me. Where have you been? Run out on you. How could you think such a thing? <laughs> I'm sorry, Pedro. It's just upset. I well, guess. I knew you would be worried, but there was nothing else I could do. I was worried, too. What do you mean? I was followed by another boat. What? See? And no sooner had I pulled away from our ship and headed up to my cabin than another boat started following me. What kind of a boat? I do not know. It could have been a government cutter. So I headed out to sea and then caught in behind them. They kept right after me, so the minute you I... Be careful, some wines, and you're going to say... Hmm? What? Oh, uh, uh, no, no, gracias. Uh, we are leaving at once. Gracias, senor. Come, Herbert. Let us get away from here. My car is outside. We will drive up to my place on the coast. Of course. Uh, here you are, waiter. I bought this shack on the beach I told you about for this purpose. A fisherman's shack. Do you know what I call it? Casa Dinero. <laughs> House of money, huh? I have done a little fishing, but only as an excuse for having the boat. <laughs> well, how is everything in New York, eh? I always liked New York. Did you? Perhaps next year I will go back there for a visit and live in style, eh? Of course, you will have to stay down here for quite a while until this blows over. Maybe not. They can't raise anything to me. How much did you get? Well, according to our agreement... Your share should be $5,000. $5,000? Beautiful one! But look, I want to know about this boat that follows you. Well, I was plenty worried, so instead of landing at my place, I landed half a mile up on the beach, 
The second I got out, I picked the spot and buried the package in the sand. Well, I was afraid they would follow me to the shack. Oh, but you agreed that you'd hide it under the floor in a gas can. I ask you, Herbert, what would you have done? I was not taking any chances. Oh, and just where did you bury it, Pedro? Oh, it is easy to find. A half mile up the beach and 50 feet from a small... What is it, Pedro? What's the matter? There is a car following us. What? Maybe the police. Police? Step on it, Pedro. Why should the police follow us? Hurry, Pedro. They're gaining on us faster. It is wide open. Ah, they have turned left. It was not the police. Pedro, look out, those kids. Eh? What? Going on the road. <laughs> Pedro, you didn't hit them. Pedro, are you all right? Pedro, can you hear me? Pedro, Pedro, tell me. Tell me. Tell me, where is it? You've got to tell me. The money. Pedro, where did you bury the money? You can't. You can't die. You've got to tell me. Pedro, 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 where is it? Poor Pedro was dead, quite dead. And with him died the hopes, the plans, the 20-year plan of Herbert Lang, the perfect crime that ended in failure. Herbert was a thief, but worse still, he followed it up with murder. Oh, yes, Herbert killed Hazel, choked her, and threw her over the first night out. She wasn't in the room that following morning. The steward only thought she was. And Herbert himself forged the suicide note. For two years now, a thin, emaciated, glassy-eyed figure has been wandering around a Brazilian beach, digging holes in the sand. No one knows why, and no one cares. Just another simple-minded derelict. And poor Herbert Lang will go on digging for a long, long time. I know. <laughs> CBS has presented The Whistler. Original music for this production was composed and conducted by Wilbur Hatch. The Whistler is written and directed by J. Donald Wilson and originates from Columbia Square in Hollywood. Next week, same time... I, The Whistler... Return to tell you another unusual tale. Good night. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. You are listening to Golden Age Radio. Rumble.com slash C slash G-A-R. Brought to you by G3PL.com. Adventures of the Shadow are on the air. Brought to you each week by the Blue Coal Dealers of America. These dramatizations are designed to demonstrate forcibly to old and young alike that crime does not pay. The shadow will be with us in just a moment. But first, here's an important tip that will add to the enjoyment of your home. When ordering fuel, be sure to ask for blue coal. You'll enjoy greater heating comfort at less cost. What's more, the extra convenience of a steady burning, longer lasting blue coal fire will give you more leisure time. More time to enjoy a truly comfortable, well-heated home. Call your neighborhood blue coal dealer. You'll find him eager to please you with a prompt, clean delivery, plus free information about low-cost home heating. Phone him tomorrow, won't you? He'll show you the easy blue coal way to heat your home. The Shadow. 
mysterious character who aids the forces of law and order is, in reality, Lamont Cranston, wealthy young man about town. As the shadow, Cranston is gifted with hypnotic power to cloud men's minds so that they cannot see him. Cranston's friend and companion, the lovely Margot Lane, is the only person who knows to whom the voice of the invisible shadow belongs. Today's story, The Leopard Strikes. Officer, Officer Kelly. Well, how are you, Mike? Fine. Had any excitement tonight? <laughs> now, my young lad, what would be excitement on a beat like this around the animal house? <laughs> Nothing's happened here in the park for 20 years. Well, you can always hope. Oh, yes, that you can. What time have you got, Officer Kelly? And it's almost midnight. Well, if anything's to happen, this is the time. Midnight. Say, do those animals always howl like that? Never to let up all night long. They just don't like being caged up in a zoo, I guess. <laughs> You'll get used to them after a while. Oh, I suppose so. You know, for my first assignment, I sort of hoped I'd get a more exciting place than this. Well, the park is the home of the rookies and the has been son. Bar and promotion, you start here, move away, and end here. Well, I hope I move away soon. Maybe you've noticed I sort of like action. Well, if it's action you want, go in and wrestle with one of them wild beasts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is the only culprit you'll ever find here, Mac. <laughs> I guess you're right. Well, I suppose I'd better take one more turn around the beat. Yes, yes, see that the squirrels and the spooners are behaving themselves. Well, see you later, son. Okay, see you later. Excitement. Ah, the rookies want excitement. It's those green kids that are pushing us old ones off the force. Well, maybe some of them will get more than they bargained for. Uh, hey, what's that? Hey, Mac! Mac, what's the matter? Mac! Mac, what in the name of... Glory be. Mac, bye. What happened, son? Mac! Mac, your face! Cut! Mac... Speak, son, speak. Wake me, read all about it. Policeman killed by wild animal in park. Read all about it, Harry. They're holding an inquiry at the head keeper's office at the zoo this afternoon, Margot. Commissioner Weston asked me to drop by. Well, Lamont, why are they holding an inquiry? They know how he was killed. I'm not so sure that they do. What do you mean? Well, when I spoke to the commissioner this morning, he told me that there was no evidence of any animal having escaped from the zoo last night. Uh, excuse me, but uh, could I subject my opinion? <laughs> of course, Shrevey. This is your cat. What is your opinion, Shrevey? Well, uh, it is not exactly my opinion, hey. It is more the opinion of my friend and acquaintance, Big Charlie. Oh, well, what is Big Charlie's opinion? Well, he is making the observation, uh, which is the same thing as an opinion, that this here now cop is not being killed by one of the animals from the zoo at all. No. No. He thinks it was done by a squirrel. A squirrel? <laughs> exactly, exactly. He says that them bushy-tailed beasts can be very mean when they're of a mind to be. Oh, now, Shrevey, how could a squirrel kill a man? Now, that's just what I asked Big Charlie. And what did Big Charlie say? Well, he just shows me a scar on his finger that was given to him by a squirrel. And he says that if a squirrel could do that to him, he could certainly kill anybody else. Oh, Shrevey! <laughs> That's an excellent deduction. In fact, I'd like to hear more, Shrevey. But I think we've reached the zoo. Reached the zoo, huh? Uh -huh. Oh, yeah, yeah, so we have, so we have. All right. Come on, Marco. All right. Uh, do you want I should wait, hey? Well, uh, yes, you might as well, Shrevey. Good. I'm going out and give a couple of squirrels to third degree. <laughs> <laughs> what a man. Oh, Lamont, are they holding this inquiry in one of the cages? Well, if they are, they'll probably lock you up and throw away the key. Oh. <laughs> we go right in here. Oh, thanks. Oh, hello, Cranston. Come on in. Well, thank you, Commissioner. How are you, Margot? Fine, thank you, Commissioner. These are the two keepers who were on duty here at the zoo last night, Mr. Oliver and Mr. Harper. How do you do? How do you do? Well, have you come up with anything yet, Commissioner? Nothing. The officer was killed by a wild animal, all right. 
But both these men here swear that none of them was loose last night. Yes. Yes, that's right. They were all locked in. Oh. Any clues at all? Well, Harper here thinks that the job was done by some member of the cat family. Isn't that right? Oh, yes, yes. After looking at the body, my guess would be that he was killed by a member of the cat family. I see. Well, uh, why do you say that? Well, we get to know all the habits of the animals around here. We watch them eat and sleep. We practically live with them. My opinion is that uh, it was a leopard. Wait a minute. I don't agree. Well, now, John, you know... That Why you said... don't you agree with him, Mr. Oliver? Because that would put the blame on Rebu. She's the only leopard we've got here. Why, she wouldn't hurt nobody. She was in her cage all night, and you know that, huh? Now, wait a minute, John. I wasn't blaming Rebu. Of course, I know she was in a cage. But there's more than one leopard in the world, you know? Yeah, I know, and I also know you don't like Rebu. You're jealous because she only lets me feed her. She'll only obey right. me. Hold on, hold on, well, both of you. You can settle it... that later. I've got a tougher problem on my hands. There's a wild beast at large in this park, and we've got to find it. Uh, just how do you propose to do that, Commissioner? Well, now, don't you worry. We'll, we'll find him, that's all. We'll set traps for him. Yeah, set traps. That's what we'll do. Hmm, that should be very effective, very You'll probably catch everything in town but the leopard. But in this weather, you might catch a cold in that trap. Yes. You're both a big help. If you don't mind, I'll conduct this thing my own way. But, Commissioner, you asked me to come here. Yes, I thought that your knowledge of wild animals that you picked up in Africa or wherever it was uh, might be of use to me. Well, I still offer that knowledge. No, I don't need it. Hmm. Very well. I guess we better be going, Margot. Yeah. All right, Lamont. Good day, gentlemen. Goodbye. Goodbye. Good Goodbye. Good Good catch a cold. Now, Margot, it's... Might be wise if I took an active interest in this affair. What do you mean, Lamont? That argument between the two keepers interested me very much. I'd like to learn more about them. Well, what are you going to do? Well, this evening, late this evening, those two gentlemen are going to receive a visit from the shadow. <laughs> like the others. Now, look, Oliver. There are other animals in this house, you know. They need attention, too. Oh, Rebu hasn't finished her dinner yet. Well, can't she eat it without your help? Leave me alone, Harper. I'll tend to the others when I'm done with Rebu. <laughs> I wonder if she knows that she's under suspicion of committing murder. Now, listen, Harper, don't start that again. Well, you heard what the police commissioner said. Well, who put the idea in his head that a leopard done the killing? You did. Well, he asked my opinion, didn't he? Yes, and you tried to frame poor Rebu. That's what you've done. <laughs> what was that? Which of you gentlemen is on the right side of this quarrel, may I ask? Who was that? Who spoke to us? I did, gentlemen. Who are you? Men call me the Shadow. Well, where are you? I can't see you. I'm standing right here beside you. Where? Where? Don't try to find me. By my hypnotic power, I've made myself invisible to your eyes. What are you doing here? What do you want of us? I'd like to learn just what you both know about the officer who was killed last night here in the park. We don't know anything about it, except that he was killed by a wild animal. Was that animal from the zoo? I don't know. Do you know what kind of an animal it was? Why, well, it was a leopard, I guess. No, no, he's wrong. It wasn't a leopard. How do you know? Uh, I don't know, except I know it wasn't Rebu here. And that's who Harper's trying to put the blame on. Why should Mr. Harper do that? Because he's scared of her, that's why. She hates him and he knows it. That's why he wants to get rid of her. Oh, he doesn't know what he's saying. I'm not blaming this cat here. And I'm not afraid of her either. Then why don't you go into her cage the way I do? Just a minute. You're avoiding my questions, both of you. You're hiding something from me. Something that you know and refuse to tell. Isn't this true? Isn't it? No, no. Of course it isn't. I don't believe either one of you. So let me warn you. I'm going to be watching you both. And if the leopard strikes again, you'll answer to the shadow. Read all about it! Mysterious leopard killed two more people in park. No clues found. Get your man. Lamont, 
We've been walking through this park for three nights straight, and all we've accomplished is to fill our shoes with snow. Oh, I'm sorry, Margo. Now, Hawkshaw, you know you're not a bit sorry. <laughs> well, I... I just didn't want to miss being around or that Don Leopard should strike again. Well, do you think that we might be the victims? Mm, could be. What? Oh, don't be alarmed. I have a gun here with me. Besides, I'm afraid this weather is a little too cold for a tropical beast. Yes, but maybe we got... What was that? Come on, Margo. Stop! Stop! Through these bushes here, Margo. All right. Oh, well, this is the heaven. Now, what happened? What's going on here? Look. Look, the leopard. The leopard has struck again. Oh, Lamont, look at that body. Margo, stand over there, please. Ah, uh, he's beyond help. He's dead. Yes. Who is the victim, do you know? A part derelict from his appearance. Did you see the leopard? Uh, yes. Yes, I did. Where were you when the screams were heard? Uh, where was I when I... I was walking my beat about 50 yards away. When I heard the scream, I come running. Now, what happened then? When I came near this clearing, I saw a large spotted animal standing over the body, tearing at it with its claws. Well, I... I was so surprised, I... I cried out. And the animal heard you? Yes. He turned quickly and snarled and leaped into the bushes. I see. And that's when you fired at him? Yes. I... I was quite a distance away, but I think that one of my shots must have winged him. Oh. I'll have another look at this body. Uh, he did a job on him, didn't he? Hmm. It was a leopard, all right. That's their method of killing. Yes, the same dirty beast that got my pal, Mac. And there's something wrong here. Something missing. Can't quite place what it is. I'm going out to send out an alarm. All right. I'll be right back. Oh, Lamont, what do you make of it? I don't know, Margo. When I was hunting one time in Africa, one of our native boys was killed by a leopard. The body, when we found it, looked exactly as this one does. Then there is a wild leopard at large. I'm not sure. Well, this killing tonight has brought back that whole episode in Africa. There's, there's something missing here. Oh. Well, Lamont, all I can say is it's a good thing I'm not an old-fashioned girl. <laughs> what do you mean? After this little episode, I certainly need some smelling salts. Some smell... Margot, that's it. What? That's it. What, Lamont? That's what's been missing. The smell. The unmistakable smell of the leopard. Is the killer really a leopard? That's an important question. But there's no question about this. It's easy to keep your home cozy and comfortable morning, noon, and night with Blue Coal. And here's why. Blue Coal is America's finest hard coal, carefully prepared for convenient home heating. You can depend upon Blue Coal for quick heat on cold mornings. Steady, helpful warmth all day long. And a slow, long-lasting fire when you bank it for the night. No wonder thousands of people are heating their homes this easy blue coal way. What's more, with each order of blue coal, you enjoy the full benefit of your friendly blue coal dealer's extra home heating service. He'll gladly send a trained serviceman to give your home heating plant a thorough inspection and help solve any heating problems you have. This extra service is yours for the asking. Yes, you definitely get more for your money when you place your order with a blue coal dealer. So next time you order fuel, ask for blue coal. Your neighborhood dealer's name is listed in the where to buy it section of the classified telephone directory under the words blue coal. And now, back to Lamont and Margot. <laughs> Dragging me now, Lamont. To the zoo, Margo. The commissioner should be there by now. Are you going to tell him about your discovery? You mean the fact that there was no smell of leopard at the scene of the crime? Yes. <laughs> I should say not. Can't you imagine what his reaction would be to that? Yes, I suppose it'd be a big joke to him. Yes, certainly. Oh, the squad cars are arriving now. That's the zoo just ahead. Hey, Lamont, you're not forgetting that Commissioner Weston is still angry at both of us. Oh, he gets over those things very quickly, Margo. <laughs> Wait a minute. Uh, oh, where are you going? Oh, uh, we are friends of the commissioner, officer. Oh, okay. If you're looking for him, he's in the big animal house. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Come on, Margo. Right. Hey, Lamont, just how important is the fact that there wasn't any smell of leopard near the body? It can be most important, Margo. Well, how do you mean? Well, I, I can't tell you that yet. 
In here, Margot. Well, I tell you, I don't oh, look, they're all over there by that cave. Hey. Oh. Good evening, Commissioner. Oh, it's you, Cranston. What are you doing here? Well, Margot and I happened to be in the park when the last victim was killed. Oh, yes, I remember them, Commissioner. They stood by the body while I phoned in the alarm, sir. Well, my amateur friend, you're a little too late this time. Well, what do you mean? Crime has been solved. Really? Well, who is the murderer? There he is, right in that cage. A leopard that belongs in the zoo. No, no, you're wrong. Quiet, Oliver. Lamont, that animal is dead. Yes, killed by one of the bullets from Officer Kelly's gun. You mean one of the shots you fired in the park, officer? Yes, sir. I got one of them all right. And he crawled back to his cage and died, is that it? That's it. It's not true. Rebo didn't do it. Oliver, your friendly leopard did do it, and that's that. Uh, Were you on duty here in the zoo when the animal got out, Oliver? No, no, I always eat my late dinner at this time, but I I wasn't gone long, and she couldn't have got out of this house. She got out all right. Uh, May I examine the beast, Commissioner? My compliments, Cranston. Thank you. Can I make out your report? I'm calling this case officially closed. Yes, sir. Calling the squad that's combing the park. We're finished here. Yes, sir. I wouldn't be too Uh, sure of that, Commissioner. Huh? What's that? I say I wouldn't call this case officially closed yet. Why not? Just uh, come here a minute, will you please? Uh, What is it? What is it? Officer Kelly killed this uh, leopard, right? Yes, Kelly killed him. Would you say that Officer Kelly was a knife thrower by any chance? Knife thrower? Yes. Of course he's not a knife thrower. Oh, that's strange, because this animal died from a stab wound in the heart. Lamont, you certainly spoiled the commissioner's case. Yes, I'm afraid I did. What to do now? Hmm? I say, what's the next angle on this thing? Oh, well, we'll have to wait until the police clear out of the zoo. Then what? Then the two gentlemen in charge of the animals are going to receive another visit from the shadow. Tried to put the blame on you, didn't they, girl? Hmm? Tried to say you killed all those people. Mr. Oliver. Uh, uh, Mr. Oliver. Oh, it's, it's the shadow again. That's right. What do you want? Why are you here? Don't you remember my telling you that if another murder occurred, I would return? Uh, yes, yes, I do. Where is your friend Harper? I don't know. Isn't he supposed to be on duty tonight? Yes, yes, he is. Then why isn't he here? I don't know, I tell you. I haven't seen him since early in the evening. Before, before Rebo was killed. You don't like Mr. Harper, do you? Why do you say that? It's true, isn't it? What difference does that make? Do you know who killed that animal? Do you? Why do you keep asking me all these questions? Because I want to find out all I can about Harper. He killed your leopard. I know he did. And you know it, too. Yeah. But you're afraid to say so because he has some hold on you. Something that he knows will keep you from talking. Oh, yeah? Sure, you're afraid of him, Oliver. Afraid? That's not true. I'm not afraid of him. Even though he has got something on me, that doesn't stop me from talking. Especially since he killed Rebo, eh? Okay. Okay, I'll tell about him. I'll tell plenty. Good. Where is he now? Well, I'm not sure. He's probably downtown, down where he always goes, to the big house on Columbus Square. What's down there in that house? That's where they meet. All of them meet. Who meet? The whole cult. Cult? You mean that... I mean that Harper is the leader of a crazy... Oliver! Oliver! Uh, Didn't didn't get a a chance to... Yes, yes? To tell you the cult is... He's dead. should cruise around the square again, Mr. Cranston, hey? Uh, uh, yes, Shrevey. Uh, once more, if you please. You think we ought to get out and ring doorbells, Lamont? No, we'll never learn anything doing that. Hey, you know, going around and around the square like this is fun. It's sort of like a merry-go-round. Hey, do you indulge much in merry-go-rounds, Mr. Cranston, hey? I haven't lately, Shrevey. It's a nice, clean sport. You know, I remember one time I'm riding on a big one. It's down on the island, and... Lamont! Uh, what is it? Shrevey, stop the cabinet. Oh, sure, sure. Lamont, that house on the corner. Two men and a girl just went up the stairs, and she seemed to be ill. They were holding her up between them. Yes, and what happened to them? I may still be upset from that killing in the park, but 
I could have sworn that when the door opened, they were greeted by what appeared to be a big leopard reared up on his hind legs. What? I'm quite sure, Lamont. Then that's the place we're looking for. It's the headquarters of the cult that Oliver spoke of just before he died. What kind of a cult? A cult of leopard women and men. I've heard much about these things, but I never never thought they were in this country. Oh, that's incredible. Margot, go get the police. Have them outside the house as soon as possible. Well, what about the girl? The girl they were bringing in that house. He's probably their next victim. Go, Margot. Go at once. As we are all gathered, the ceremony will begin. To you, O oh leopard, most lovely of beasts, we bow down in humble reverence. Your beauty of form we greatly admire. Your courage and cunning is our courage and cunning. As you are, so we will try to be. As you so majestically stalk through the jungle, so we too will stalk through the streets of the city. Our deeds are deeds that are done for you. No! <laughs> priestess! Hi, priestess. Yes, O oh worshipper? The offering. The sacrifice is ready. There is time yet. There is time. No. No, we must do it now. Oh, you are too eager. We are not really going to kill this beautiful girl. Why do we not kill her? Why? Because we are not murderers. We worship beauty, not death. Death is the beauty supreme. You do not know what you are saying. The cult of the leopard is death. It has always been death. Worshipper, you are behaving most strangely tonight. Why did we bring the victim here if not to kill? Enough of that talk. There is no need. Your arm. What is wrong with your arm? Oh, that is... How just... did you hurt it? Answer me. How did you hurt your arm? <laughs> I'll tell you how he hurt it. Who speaks? It is I, the shadow. Shadow? Quiet! Quiet! But where are you? I cannot see you. I am standing right beside you here in the shadows. Your friend Mr. Harper can explain how I make myself invisible. Do you know this, this voice? Did you bring him here? No. No. No, he didn't bring me here, madam. I came here seeking him. What do you mean? I said that I'd reveal how you hurt your arm, Mr. Harper. How did he do it? He was shot. Shot by a policeman who discovered him in the act of committing murder. That's not true. What are you saying? This man, this member of your cult, disguised as a leopard, has already claimed two victims. No. Killing them as a leopard kills by slashing their throats with razor-sharp claws. Is this true, Harper? No, of course not. He's lying. I suppose that you deny, too, that you shot and killed your fellow keeper in the zoo, just as he was about to tell me all about you. Of course I deny it. Then how do you account for that wound in your arm? Yes. Yes, Harper. Explain that. Why should I have to explain? What are you trying to do to me? I already know what I'm going to do to you. I'm going to turn you over to the police. Oh, no. No, you're not. Let him, Harper. Then you can prove your innocence. You keep out of this. He's afraid. Afraid that he'll be found out. I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid of anything. Harper... Papa, what is wrong with you? Do you think that any of you can trap me? That you can match my cunning or courage? The cunning and courage of a leopard? Papa, do not talk that way. What if I did kill? It's a leopard's right to kill. Wantonly, joyously, just for the love of killing. Be quiet, Harper. You can't silence me. And you can't trap me either. I'll fight. I'll claw. I'll kill. You hear me? Kill. Kill. Look out for him. Stand back! Harper! Oh. Oh, you have killed him. That's right, madam. And now you and your cult are going to have to explain your existence to the police. Well, Margot, 
Weston has rounded up all the members of the cult, so I guess our work is done. Well, Lamont, what I don't understand is how a cult like that was formed. What was the purpose of it? Well, cults of leopard men had their origin in Africa. They're still active there. Their ritual is a form of pagan worship. This group that we encountered tonight were obvious fanatics who'd learned the secrets of the African ceremony and were practicing them here. Hmm. Nice people, these fanatics. I wonder if you'd mind taking me home, Lamont. Why go home? Because I want to dig into my closet and burn my leopard skin coat. <laughs> In just a moment, we'll hear from the shadow again. But first, here's John Barkley, America's home heating expert. Mr. Barkley? Thank you. And good evening, friends. Right now, with the whole world in a state of chaos, it's cheering to realize that in spite of war and widespread destruction, civilization marches steadily ahead. For instance, take the American home of a hundred years ago. There was no electricity, no running water, and heating plants were in a crude state of development. Now compare that home with the American home of today, with its electric lights, modern plumbing, and central heating. And you know, folks, we can thank the blue coal engineers for many of the modern benefits of central heating. They've given us blue coal, America's finest hard coal. And they've perfected the blue coal heat regulator that automatically operates furnace dampers. All you do is just set that modern thermostat for whatever temperature you want. Then you can sit back and enjoy steady, even, healthful warmth. Yes, blue coal and a blue coal heat regulator are the modern combination for real comfort. So bring your home up to date. Buy blue coal. Just call your neighborhood blue coal dealer. He'll gladly show you this easy, economical way to heat your home. Thank you. Today's program is based on a story copyrighted by the Shadow Magazine. The characters, names, places, and plot are fictitious. Any similarity to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. <laughs> the weed of crime bears bitter fruit. Crime does not pay. The shadow knows. <laughs> Next week, same time, same station, the Blue Coal Dealers of America bring you a thrilling adventure of the shadow that will hold you in breathless suspense from start to finish. So be sure to listen. And be sure to phone your friendly Blue Coal Dealer for greater heating comfort at less cost. You are listening to Golden Age Radio. Rumble.com slash C slash G-A-R. Brought to you by G3PL.com. The Kraft Foods Company brings you The Adventures of the Falcon, starring Les Damon. Hello? Yes, this is the Falcon speaking. Oh, Denise. Oh, thanks for calling, but I can't make it tonight, Angel. A quarter of a million dollars worth of jewelry is missing. And when that much ice is on the loose, someone is likely to get frozen stiff. This is Ed Hurley, he friends, inviting you on behalf of the Kraft Foods Company to listen to The Adventures of the Falcon. You met the Falcon first in his best-selling novels. Then you saw him in his thrilling motion picture series. Now join him on the air when the Falcon solves... The Case of the Double Nephew. Before we join the Falcon in his latest adventure, I'd like to tell you folks about Kraft's golden cheese food, Velveeta. Velveeta is such good eating. 
Just taste that grand, rich, yet mild cheddar cheese flavor. And Velveeta is so good for you. It's rich in important food values from milk itself. For swell-tasting snacks, for good, hearty sandwiches, for thrifty, easy, hot dishes, it's smart to keep stocked with Velveeta. Get it tomorrow in the handy quarter-pound package or in the economical two-pound loaf. The cheese food of top quality. Velveeta is made only by Kraft. And now, the case of the double nephews. It's early Sunday morning in New York when Tom Lacey enters his apartment. He clicks on the light, looks around nervously, then walks quickly to the door to the bedroom. Goes in, turns on the bedside lamp between the twin beds, tosses a briefcase on his own bed, then turns to the other bed and shakes the shoulder of his pretty wife. Mm. Julie, Mm. Julie, wake up. Mm. What is... I've got to talk to you. In the morning. Do you love me, Julie? Hmm? Do you love me? Well, what kind of a... Do you? Ow! My shoulder. I've got to know. You've been drinking... Now, look, I'm serious. What time is it, anyway? Oh, no. Three o'clock. Go to bed, will now, you? Now, Julie, listen to me. Oh. J- Julie, I've... I've done something. It, it's hard to explain. Another woman? No, no, no. Nothing like that. Well, it, it's, it's going to mean that... Well, I, I'm going to have to go away. I want you to go with me. I want you to stick by me. Will you? What have you done? Will you stick by me, no matter what? What have you done? I... Uh... I robbed the vault when I closed up last night. Robbed? Yeah. More than a quarter of a million dollars worth of jewelry. I know it was a crazy thing to do, but I blew my top. For four years, I've almost been running the firm. You know that. Yesterday, I find out Carraway is retiring. You know I've been counting on them making me manager when he quit. They didn't. A wire came from the Forrest family estate in Oregon. Old man Forrest is sending one of his nephews, Ev Forrest, a kid right out of school, never been in New York, doesn't know a thing about the business. He's going to take over. Wouldn't you know? Well, do you blame me, Junie? Do you blame me for getting sore? That's why I looted the safe. I was sore. What's the good? They'll know you did it. Well, I didn't stop to think. I just said to myself, they don't want me here, okay? I'll get out. Only I'm taking my share with me. I'm entitled to it. What now? But now? Well, I, I, I don't know. South America is something... You, you can go a long ways on what I took, Johnny. Where's the jewelry? Right here in my briefcase. Let's see it. Why? Just want to see what a quarter of a million looks like. Oh, okay. There you are. <gasps> Tom, they're beautiful. How are you going to sell them? Oh, there's always a market. Well, we'll find someone in South America who won't get what they're worth, but we ought to clear somewhere around 100,000. 100,000? You shouldn't have done it, Tom. Well, it's too late to think of that now. I can't put it back. There's a time lock on the vault. You're a thief. Well, what do you want me to do? (laughs) You know, I think I'm going to like South America. Are you sure there's nothing? Uh, No. No, 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 no. That'll be too late. I, I see. All right, never mind. Goodbye. Julie, I've tried all the lines. No planes until Tuesday was sunk. We can't be sunk. But it's 10 o'clock already. We're not out of the country. By the time Caraway opens the vault tomorrow, there'll be an alarm out for us, and we'll never get away. I know that. We could only but... get to Miami. And we could cross to Cuba, and once we're there, we can make arrangements. But the way things you are... you stop babbling and let me think? Well, there's nothing to think. No plane... I know, to... I know, I know. Let's get ready. We'll go to the airport anyway. Well, what good there is There may the... be a last-minute cancellation. If not, we'll charter a private plane. Yeah, that's right. Only pull yourself together. You started this. Now help me see it through. Yeah, yeah, sure, Julie. I... Now what? Well, answer it and find out. Yeah, yeah. Yes? Hello. Are you Thomas Lacey? Uh, that's right. I'm pleased to know you. I'm Ev Forrest. Ev Forrest? Yeah. I see you're surprised. Well, well we uh, didn't, didn't expect you so soon. Yeah, I know. 
My uncle had a special reason for having me get here today. Uh, may I come in? Well, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Uh, thanks. Uh, this, this is my wife. Uh, dear, I, I'd like you to meet Mr. Forrest. Ev Forrest, uh, you, know, you know, I was just telling you he's going to be the new manager. Oh, yes, how do you do, Mr. Forrest? How do you do? Now, uh, I'd like a word with Mr. Lacey. Well, go right ahead. You don't have to worry about Junie. Uh, this is very confidential. Well, whatever you say to me, you can say in front of her. Very well. It's about Mr. Carraway. Oh? How do you get along with him? Uh, so, so, why? Well, my uncle's a little concerned about the last few reports he's received from Carraway. Concerned? How? Oh. Well, the figures don't look right. And now, Carraway's resignation. Uncle wants me to look into it. That's why I came right to you. I came up directly from the station. Carraway doesn't know I'm in town. Well, what can I do? Well, we'll go down to the firm. I want to look over the books. Today, before Carraway can find out. Oh. Well, well, well I, I'm uh, sorry, Mr. Forrest, but... Uh, well, Junie and I were just leaving. We have a date. Uh, I'm sorry, but you'll have to cancel it. This can't wait. Well, gee, I, I don't know what to say if you'd only given us some notice. Oh, I couldn't. Now, I'll be frank, Lacey. We suspect Carraway, not you. But we don't know how close you are to him. We didn't want you to warn him. I see. That's why I'm going to have to ask both of you, you and your wife, to come along with me. I'm awfully sorry to have to do this, but, uh, well, you see how it is. Uh-huh. And uh, I'm awfully sorry to have to do this. Tom! Oh! All right, Julie, come on, let's get out of no, here. No, wait a minute, Tom. Well, why don't you use your head instead of jumping into things? Well, he was going to delay I know, I know. But how far do you think we're going to get when Mr. Forrest wakes up? What? Call the police the first thing. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I, I didn't think. I've got the jitters. I've got to have a drink. Take a good stiff one. You'll need it. Why did he have to show up today? Well, maybe it's a good thing he did. Now, we don't have to rush to get away. We can take our time. Well, what do you mean when Forrest wakes Who up? Who says he's going to wake up? What? Take your drink. Oh, yeah. No. Now, what are you talking about? Mr. Forrest would look good in one of my scarves, don't you think? Huh? Of course, he's going to have to wear it a little too tight for comfort. Oh, no, no, Julie. You can't quit now, Tom. You're going to do what I tell you. No, I You've can't. You've got to. Oh. No time to uh. argue. He's coming, too. Take another drink. I'll get the scarf. Oh, we shouldn't have killed him. All we had to do was tie him you up. You still don't get it. Now we have a body to dispose of. It all takes time. Now we have time. How? We still have to get away. No, we don't. That's what you can't seem to get through your thick head. But, Joni, tomorrow the robbery will be discovered and maybe the body. Who's to say you committed the robbery? Well, it couldn't have been an outside job. There's a burglar alarm and a time-locked vault. Besides, besides, I locked up. I'm the only one who could have done... Who knows you locked up? Carraway. That's right. Only suppose you say he locked up. It's your word against his. Now that we know old man Forrest already suspects Carraway of being a crook, Carraway hasn't a chance. Uh, say, that's right. Yeah, sure it is. Oh, well, still, a, there'll be an investigation. Our place may be searched. That's why we had to get rid of Ev Forrest. We have to have time to hide the stuff and plant a little of it where it'll do Carraway the least good. Oh. The robbery's sure to be pinned on him, and if Ev Forrest's body is ever found, he'll take credit for that, too. Ev Forrest found out about the robbery, so Carraway killed him. Yeah, it might work. It will. If you just sit tight and keep your mouth shut. <laughs> Hello? Hello, is that Michael Waring, the Falcon? Yes, this is the Falcon speaking. How do you do, Mr. Waring? This is James Calloway. Something dreadful's happened. Frightful. I don't know how to... Uh, uh, can you come over here right away? Over where? Forest Jewelers. I, um, uh, it's fantastic, but I'm suspected of robbery. Fantastic. Well, nothing like a little fantasy now and then. All right, Calloway, I'll be over. And, uh, you will, of course, bring references. Will I? Well, I've heard you're a competent detective, but this is a highly important matter. Great deal at stake. And I must be sure I'm dealing with a completely trustworthy and capable person. 
You have my word for it. No need for references. Uh, nevertheless, I prefer to see the references. You doubt my word? Fantastic. <laughs> There it is, Mr. Waring. The whole story. Only two possible suspects. My assistant, Thomas Lacey, and myself. And since I know it's not myself, it must be Lacey. Mm -hmm. Though it's hard to believe. Been with us for years. Quiet chap, respectable. Whole thing's fantastic. Uh, yeah, but where do I fit? The police and insurance detectives are on the case. I want my name cleared. And a little peace. I've been grilled for hours. So's Lacey. Now they're waiting. Hoping one of us will crack. What makes you think I can speed up the cracking? There are ways. Oh, no, you don't say. I I think you know what I mean. I think so, too. Good. I think I can trust you to see that Lacey is properly uh, uh, uncomfortable. <laughs> of course, uh, you understand, Mr. Waring. I, I deplore such tactics, but, uh, well, under the circumstances, what can one do? One can go to blazes, and you're just the one to do it. Uh, what's that? You hired yourself the wrong boy, Carraway. Third degree is out of my line. Oh, now, now, now. I, did I say anything? Yes, you certainly did say. Oh, well, you misunderstood me. I don't think so. Well, you... Uh, you're not going to mention this. I'm making no promises. I'll... Look, let's be reasonable. Nothing hasty, eh? I'm prepared to pay. Well, I'm not prepared to accept. Well, suppose we forget what I just said. Use your own methods, whatever you prefer. Only continue to work for me. Uh, see if you can't get something on, Lacey. No rough stuff? No, no, I... I had no idea you private detectives were so uh, concerned with propriety, as it were. Yeah, well, maybe I'm an exception. Now, suppose you send for Lacey. I'd like to talk to him. Here? Here. Very well. Yes, Mr. Carraway. Send Mr. Lacey in. Yes, sir. And uh, now, our little conversation, I, I trust it'll go no further. All right, Carraway. It's not that important. I'm glad you see it that way. Unless something happens to Lacey. Oh. Uh, what do you want, Carraway? Uh, come in, Lacey. Come in. And my name is Mr. Carraway. I thank you to remember I'm still in charge until Mr. Forrest arrives. Now, why don't you fire me if you think I'm a crook? When I can prove it, I shall. Now, I'd like you to meet Mr. Waring. Mr. Michael Waring, the Falcon. How do you do, sir? Hello, Lacey. Are you crazy? What's that? Well, one of you is, to pull a job like this. Well, I... I, I guess... Mr. Forrest is here, Mr. Carraway. Good. Send him in. Yes. Mr. Forrest... The old man, has he come? Certainly not, Lacey. The nephew, Everett Forrest. You know we're expecting him. Well, well yes, yes, but I... What's the matter with you? Well, well nothing. Uh, nothing at all. Oh, uh, hello, Mr. Forrest. Come in. Thank you. Well, it's not the old man. Of course it isn't. What makes you think... Well, nothing, nothing. Uh, never mind, I... Uh, hello, Mr. Forrest. Uh, I'm delighted to meet you. It's lighter bodied. It's super fined. It's Kraft Salad Oil, the first salad oil ever offered for home use by the makers of all those wonderful Kraft prepared salad dressings. Yes, there is something new under the sun at your grocer's right now. A new salad oil, Kraft Salad Oil. The first salad oil ever offered for home use by the makers of all those wonderful Kraft prepared dressings. Wait till you try it in those wonderful salad dressings you make yourself. Those light-as-air chiffon cakes you're so proud of in all your special recipes that call for liquid shortening. For Kraft Salad Oil is more than just a new oil. It's a new kind of oil. Super fine for better blending by a special new Kraft process. Because it's lighter-bodied, it mixes perfectly with all ingredients. Puts new magic into dressings, cooking, and baking. Don't wait. Put this new salad oil on your shopping list right now. Remember, it's lighter bodied. It's super fine. Get Kraft salad oil tomorrow at your grocer's. Look for the bottles with the beautiful labels. Now, back to the adventures of the Falcon. 
Half a day has passed since Tom Lacey was startled by the appearance of a second Everett Forest. The first, so far as Lacey knows, is still in the East River, which makes the second a serious problem. Now, in his apartment, Lacey paces the floor while his wife watches him. I didn't know what to do, Tony. I just didn't know what to do. What'd you say to him? Nothing, nothing. I, I was too startled. I, I couldn't say this man's a fake. I know he's not F. Forrest because I've killed the real F. Forrest. All right, as long as you didn't say anything. Well, now what do we do? Just sit tight. Well, we've got to expose him. We can't. You just Well, then make him expose himself. We, we could only get the old man here face to face with this fake. We don't have to expose him. The important thing is to wait until word comes from the old Mr. Forrest. Not about the nephew, he doesn't matter, but about Carraway. Now that there's been a robbery, Forrest is sure to wire the police's suspicions about Carraway. Well, the old man's away from his home. He's on a hunting trip. They haven't been able to contact him. So we wait. But it's getting me, Joni. What's this faker up to? What does he want? What does he hope to gain by impersonating young I Forrest? I don't know. Wait a minute. I know. He, he must know about the murder. Sure. Sure, otherwise, how could he be sure the real nephew won't show up? Yeah, that's it, he knows. And this is a subtle form of blackmail. His way of telling me he knows soon he'll be coming to me direct. Junie, what am I gonna do You're now? gonna do nothing, just sit tight and wait. But he knows Now I... you listen to me. There's nothing anyone can prove. How do you know? Because if there were, the police would be holding you. Now pull yourself together, you hear? Yes, yes, Junie. I hear Which one do you think did it, Waring? Lacey. Why? That's easy, Forrest. I'm working for Carraway. Yes, but you have no proof against Lacey. No, not yet. I'm still looking for the angle. Why, what angle? Well, only an idiot would pull a job where he was sure of being one of only two possible suspects. So he must have some angle, some scheme to clinch it against the other suspect. Yes, but you don't have any idea what it is. No, do you? Well, how can I? I? I just got here. I hardly know either of the men. Neither do I. What has your uncle told you about them? Oh, nothing much. Sent you here without instructions? Oh, instructions, yes, but not on personalities. Except he did say uh, I might expect a little jealousy from Lacey. Jealousy, huh? Hmm. Well, Lacey counted on getting Carraway's job when Carraway retired. He probably resents me for taking it. Yeah, he probably does. I wonder just how much. Well, does it matter? Might be an answer. Oh, you mean the angle? Well, not the sort of angle I was looking for, but... Uh... I was trying to follow the script, and it's just possible Lacey has been ad-libbing. Hello? Mr. Waring? Yes? This is Carraway. I'm in jail. Imagine, in jail. Fantastic. Uh, you, you took the word right out of my mouth. No, fancy that. How come they jugged you? Because they're idiots, that's why. <laughs> they should know it's a plant. What's a plant? The diamond. What diamond? In my car. Oh, there were diamonds in your car. Yes, yes, Lacey must have put them there. Uh, most likely. So that's his angle. Well, I guess he is ad-libbing. Uh, what's that? That sort of plant is pretty feeble. He's working off the cuff. Well, I'll be seeing you, Caraway. Uh, are you coming down here? No, I'm going to visit Lacey. I may do some ad-libbing of my own. Hello, are you Mrs. Lacey? Yes. My name is Mike Waring. I'd like to see your husband, please. He isn't in. You mind if I come in and wait? I don't know when he'll be back. Well, I'm in no hurry. I'm sorry, Mr. Waring. My what? I, I can't ask you in. Can you keep me out? Well, that depends on how determined you are. What do you want? I told you, Lacey. I told you, he's not here. You alone? Yes, but I have a gun. Do you want to see it? No, I'll take your word for it. But I'm not so sure I'll take your word for being alone. Unless you smoke cigars. But Tom went out just a few minutes ago. The smoke hasn't cleared yet. Oh, I see. Well, I won't press the point, Angel. If Lacey doesn't want to see me... I don't know if he wants to see you or not. Does he know you? We met today at Forrest Jewelry. Oh, you're working on the robbery. Yeah. Well, when Tom comes in, I'll tell him you were here. But he's told all he knows. Mm -hmm. 
But I haven't. What do you mean? Just tell them I know how the stones got in Carraway's car. Well, what, what, what stones? The ones in Carraway's car. Were there, there stones? There were. In... Hadn't you heard? No. Well, you just ask your husband. I'm sure he knows all about it, and so do I. Are you accusing Tom? Just give Tom my message. See what he says. Good night, Mrs. Lacey. Good night. Julie, what was all that? Who was it? It was Michael Waring. The Falcon. What did he want? You. Well, why? What? what, what? He's on to you. Oh, no. He's on to you, I say. Oh, no. I stalled him because I didn't want anybody to see you till you'd pulled yourself together. But with what he knows, I'm afraid the jig's up anyway. What does he know? Everything. About Forrest? I think so. I might have known. It's no use. I'm no good at this sort of thing. There's only one thing to do. I'm going to give myself up. Don't be absurd. Put down the phone. Put it down, I say. But, Joni... I said put down the phone. We're caught. It's the electric chair. Don't you realize that? But what can we do? I got out your little revolver. Here it is. Be careful, it's loaded. Well, what good's this going to do? We're going to get away. Oh, Joni, there isn't a There's chance. There's an excellent chance if you'll do what I tell you. Now, go on, start packing while I go out for a few minutes. Where to? Never mind, where to? While I'm out, pour yourself a long glass of courage. You'll need it. Mr. Waring? Yes? This is Mrs. Lacey. Oh, not little Miss Sunshine. <laughs> Maybe I wasn't friendly. I'm usually not when strange men try to force their way into the apartment. Uh, my husband's home now. He wants to see you. You gave my message? Yes. What did he say? Well, I told you he wants to see you. Is that all? Well, he claims he doesn't know anything about the diamonds in Mr. Carraway's car. Diamonds? Did I say they were diamonds? Wh what? Oh, Oh, uh, well, Tom seemed to think that that's what you meant. He did, huh? Mm. May I speak to him? Well, why not come over? He wants to talk to you in person. All right, Mrs. Lacey. I'm on my way. <laughs> All right, Tom, that's enough. Julie, what are we going to do? It's all set. I've got a taxi waiting downstairs. Oh. Uh, and then we're going? Leave it to me. All right. All right. Let's go. I in a minute. Well, what are we waiting for? You said taxi. You'll wait. I just want to... Who's that? I don't know. Who is it? Mike Waring. Waring? What's he want? Well, this spoils everything unless... Where's the gun? Right here. Good. There's only one thing to do. We've got to shoot our way out of here. Oh, no, Junie, I can't. You've got to. I can't, I can't. Do you want the electric chair? What? This is our only chance. I'll throw the door open and you shoot. No, I can't. If you shoot fast enough, Waring will never have time to get his gun out. Hey, remember me? I'm waiting. All right, I'm coming. Now, you do what I tell you. As soon as I open the door, don't give him a chance. Then we can make a run for it. <laughs> Miracle Whip. Has a flavor so pleasing. Miracle Whip. Tastes so lively, so teasing. Miracle Whip. Only one of its kind. Miracle Whip. Best salad dressing you'll find. Miracle Whip is the only one of its kind because it's a different type of salad dressing made from a secret craft recipe. Miracle Whip combines the best qualities of old-fashioned boiled dressing and fine mayonnaise. So it's truly distinctive and delicious with a flavor millions of folks call just exactly right. Try it, won't you? One taste will tell you why it's America's favorite salad dressing. The one and only Miracle Whip. Now, back to the adventures of the Falcon. Only a few seconds have passed since June Lacey and her husband set themselves for Mike Waring's entrance with a gun. You ready, Tom? Yes, Johnny, I'll try. Remember, as soon as I open the door. What the devil? Close the door, Johnny, close it. We're caught. He jumped back, now we'll send for the police. Wait a minute. There's still one thing. Oh, what's that? Give me the gun. What are you going to do with it? Let me have it. Here. But now what? Now you're going to commit suicide. 
Huh? You saw you were trapped, so you turned the gun on yourself. No, 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 Joni, wait. Don't try to kill your husband, Mrs. Lacey. <laughs> Anything happens to him, we'll know you did it. He hurt you. He couldn't have. Come on, open the door again. <laughs> and this time, come out slowly, both of you, with your hands up. And if we don't? You will when the police get here, or they'll drive you out. Now, hurry up, come on. <laughs> well, what are you going to do now, Joni? What are you going to do now? Stop it. You're such a good one at figuring things out. Well, go ahead, Joni. Start figuring. Fantastic, Waring. Absolutely fantastic. To think he'd go to such lengths. Fantastic. Uh, well, once they got rolling, there was no stopping. Especially when they were given what looked like a sure chance to frame you. Yes. Uh, has the body been recovered? Yeah. Forrest identified it as his chauffeur. His chauffeur? That's right. You see, the fellow knew Forrest was expected, so he beat him to New York and tried to trick Lacey into letting him into the building. Oh. That would get him past the burglar alarm. Then he could knock out Lacey and either blow the lock on the vault or wait until the next day when the time lock went off. Uh, but by then, I'd be back at the place. Mm hmm And he'd meet you with a gun. Anyway, once inside, his job was much simpler. That's why he tried it. And uh, got killed for it. Yes, because the story about old Forrest suspecting you of monkey shines fit in too well with the Lacey's plans. Yes, yes. But you see, uh, then Lacey lost his nerve, so his wife tried to get rid of him so he couldn't implicate her. She wanted him to take the whole blame. Oh, she see. tried to get him in a gunfight with me, and she had his gun loaded with blanks. Oh, so he'd be killed trying to make a getaway. That's it. Hmm. She hoped to have me do her dirty work for him. And when I tumbled to it, I knew she'd try to frame a suicide, so I called her on that. But uh, what made you uh, uh, tumble, as you put it? Oh, well, the whole thing added up wrong. Her not letting me see Lacey when he was obviously in, then her calling me right back saying Lacey wanted to see me. But not letting me speak to him on the phone. I see. So you anticipated the trap. Uh-huh. And I didn't figure that, even with my bluffing, I could represent enough of a threat to make them go gunning for me, so it looked like the trap was set for Lacey. That's why I was ready to duck instead of shoot. Well, I'm glad you figured it out. Nice bit of deduction. Very nice. In fact, I might almost say... Fantastic? Uh, exactly. Uh, <laughs> how did you know? Do you like rich, delicious chocolate-flavored malteds? Well, you can make a malted just like that right in your own kitchen with Kraft chocolate-flavored malted milk. Just make a tasty paste of Kraft chocolate-flavored malted milk and a little milk in the bottom of a big glass. Fill the glass with chilled milk, stir it once more, and there. A Kraft malted is mighty nourishing, too, because it's filled with all the food values in milk. Get a jar of Kraft chocolate-flavored malted milk from your grocer and enjoy a Kraft malted often. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. You are listening to Yo Kajam. Until now, this story has been. Top Secret. Top Secret, the new NBC presentation starring gorgeous Ilona Massey as the Baroness Karen Geza. In transcribed dramas of international intrigue and espionage before and during World War II. Assignment 3, The Package in Tangiers. A story until now. Top Secret. In Tangiers, Monsieur Brun, murder is like love. The essence is quietness and privacy. Huh? She'll be quiet, all right. She'll be out for days. Take her downstairs to our little room. Oh, it's too bad you had to hit her. It's too bad we have to kill her. Well, that's a bit risky, isn't it? Tangiers is a neutral zone. Uh, we will take her to the cliffs tonight. A shot, 
A push? Voilà. And what will be left? Nothing to see when push away. Now, take her downstairs to our little room. Yes, Captain. Tiny, isn't she? Hurry <laughs> back, will you, Monsieur Brown? We have a lot to do. Consciousness came back. I had gambled and I had lost. I had made a mistake. As I lay on the filthy bed in the airless cell, I could hear the voice of the farmer, my chief, the man who hired me to spy against the Nazis in Hitler's Berlin. In espionage, Baroness, your first mistake will be your last. There will be no protection in danger, no recognition. Even in death. No recognition, even in death. There would be nothing to identify me as the little manicurist who became the personal maid, almost the confidential companion of Emmy Göring, the statuesque consort of the number two Nazi himself. Why is it, Karen, that in a house with 30 bedrooms there isn't one good mirror? Oh, the hat is very becoming, Frau Göring. <laughs> well, it will have to do. I'll be back in a couple of hours. I'll wear the white satin and the emeralds tonight. Yes, Frau Göring. Goodbye, Karen. Goodbye. It's Karen. Karen, I... It's all right. It's, I, I'm on the phone in her bedroom. Have you any instructions? The tear garden, in an hour. Fifteen minutes. Right. That's how it is, Karen. You've got to leave for Tangiers tonight. Is it that important? There's a leak in our intelligence down there. Four times in the past month, the Germans have gotten hold of vital information known only to a handful of men in the Allied High Command. Frau Göring will never let me go. If she won't, you'll have to go anyway. But my job in the Göring house is the best contact we have. Karen, you're going to Tangiers. It may only be for a few days. Your contact there is a little boy. Go to the bazaar of the singing fountain. There is a blind beggar who walks the bazaar with a little boy leading him. But there must be many blind beggars in Tangier. In the bazaar of the singing fountain, there is only one. One beggar in a bazaar? One little boy, age 12, with gray hair. I'm sorry, Karen, it is impossible. You've been with me less than a month, and now you want a week's vacation. No, it is impossible. Oh, I wish you would change your mind, Frau Göring. Put the front curls higher. Yeah. No, higher still. Oh, no, no, no. Give me the comb. Yes, Frau Göring. Thank you. Where did you want to go? Tangiers. Tangiers? Yes, why? Tangiers? 
Will you step outside a moment, Karen? I wish to telephone privately. Certainly, Frau Göring. I'll call you when I'm through. Yes, Frau Göring. Most amazing luck. My maid wants to go to Tangiers. Yes. I'm sure of it. No, I don't think she'd ever suspect. Look, will you arrange for payment? 25,000 American dollars. Yes. She doesn't have to know anything. I know it's risky, but there's no other way. And she's a sensible girl. Right. Yes, goodbye. Karen? I'm through. Frau Göring, I was thinking that with the white satin... Karen, I've changed my mind. You may have your vacation. Oh, thank you, Frau Göring. Uh, would you do a little errand for me in Tangiers? Of course I will, anything. When are you leaving? Well, um, uh, I thought that... Tonight? Uh, yes, if you wish. Very well. Take this note to Saxel at the airdrome. I see. One of the Reichsmarschall's private planes will be at your disposal. The pilot's name is Captain Klein. Yes. In Tangiers, go to this address... And ask for Suleiman Abdel Kabir. He will give you a package. You bring back the package to me. Yes. Uh, would it be too curious to ask what the package contains? Much too curious. Yes, Frau Göring. Now, this card will serve as your identification at the house of El Kabir. Mm -hmm. The signature is that of the man we both serve. Hermann. <laughs> I don't like it, Karen. Farmer, I have to go. Captain Kleinst is waiting. The plane is ready to take off. But what is it? What is Emmy going after? I don't know. She's talked about a sable coat. Tangiers for a sable coat? I must go. It's dangerous for us to be seen together. Your job is more important than a package for Emmy Goering. What better way to find a leak in Allied intelligence than to pose as a German agent? I have a card signed by Herman himself. The flight to Tangiers was uneventful, except for a moment of heartache when my Nazi pilot refueled outside Paris, occupied Paris. When I arrived in Tangiers, I took a room at the Fedella Hotel. Then I made my way to the bazaar of the singing fountain to look for a blind beggar led by a little boy with gray hair. Blind. My child, your cause is good, but your manners are bad. I ask only arms, madame, not instruction. One takes off his hat to a lady, even when one begs for his father, who is blind. As you wish, madame. There. <gasps> I am from the farmer. Bring your father to the Fedella Hotel, room 23. It's on the first floor. <laughs> What are you doing in my hotel room? Fräulein, it is the business of German intelligence to watch people who arrive in Tangier in one of Goering's private planes. And to break into their hotel rooms? You have nothing to fear, Fräulein, if you can identify yourself. What is that? What is what? There's someone at the window. You seem very nervous. Open it. Certainly. Your fears are groundless. Herr, uh, what is your name? Never mind names. Show me your identification. I am the maid, the personal companion of Frau Göring. Here is a card signed by the Reichsmarschall himself. Does that satisfy you? Yeah. My apologies, Fräulein. 
what you were seen talking to the little boy in the bazaar. For months I have suspected his father. Will you leave now? Someday I will get that old beggar. Blind. <laughs> bah, he is a fox. And he will be killed the way all enemies of Germany... Roger! Oh! Who is it? Is there somebody there? I... You! Yes, madame. From the window. Get inside, quickly. Uh, put the window down. Hurry. What is the meaning of this? Have you gone out of your mind? I'm an expert at throwing knives, madame. It was part of my education. But why? Why? I hate Germans, madame. He threatened my father. I have killed before. You, you are not a child. You are a monster. I'll have to get out of this hotel. They'll find his body and... Oh, help me with him quickly. Under the bed. Please, please yes, hurry. Uh, <coughs> shh, shh. What is it? Yes, madame, we shall. I have plenty. Thank you. You idiot. You may have ruined everything. <coughs> when they're out, <restored>, madame. <coughs> One always kills Germans. They blinded my father. Killed my mother. They'll find him any minute. Even under the bed. There. Now listen. Take my suitcase out the window. I'll leave by the front door. We will go to your father's house. No, madame. What? I will not take you to my father. Little boy, listen. Believe me, I am on your side. I work for the farmer. I have a plain white visiting card. For the grain of wheat? Glued in the center. No matter what you have heard about my working for Frau Göring, that is a cover. Do you understand? A cover. You do believe me, don't you? I... It is difficult, madame, these days to believe anybody. I hate Nazism and fascism as much as you do. Uh, uh, wait. I have some chocolate in my purse. I have no appetite for candy, madame. Little boy, come here. Closer. How old are you? Twelve, madame. Poor little boy. There. Thank you, madame. You're very kind. Out the window quickly with my suitcase. I will meet you at the corner in three minutes. We took a taxi. The strange, sad, gray-haired child of twelve. His face was expressionless, tired, pinched. Through the narrow streets, we drove to the worst district of Tangiers, to his father's house. I was taken to a tiny room at the back and told to wait while the boy went to for his father. She's a cheat father, like all the others. She pretends to work for both sides, but works only for herself. Where is she, my boy? In the back room. You should not judge too quickly. It is difficult for an enemy to learn the passwords of the farmer. But she has a card signed by Göring. I saw it. I saw her talking to Herr von Feld in her hotel room. I saw her. Give her my respect and apologies. I will sleep now and talk to her in the morning. But watch her. If she goes out, follow her. Yes, father. Go now, my boy. Remember, it is a sin to judge too quickly. Madame? Yes? My father's respects. He's old and tires easily. He will see you in the morning. I hope you will be comfortable here. Our house is poor, but clean. Thank you, father. I have an errand to do now. A package that must be picked up. I shall return soon. A package, madame? <laughs> Little boy, you will have to learn someday in your life how to tell when people are your friends. <laughs> I am looking for Sulaiman Abdel Qadir. Salam alaikum. I am here. Come in. Were you expecting me? At my age, Fräulein, one expects anything. How may I serve you? Here is a card. 
It is signed by the Reich Marshal himself. I am to pick up a package. Ah, yes. It is ready. Ready and waiting. Here you are, Fräulein. But, uh, uh... Why are you startled? I... I was expecting a large package. I... Preconceived ideas are usually wrong, Fräulein. May I wish you good evening? Uh, there... Is there nothing to pay? Nothing. Good evening, Fräulein. I followed her. She went to Suleiman Abdel Qadir. Father, I saw her. You are sure, my son? I saw him answer the door. I saw her go in. She's a Nazi, Father. She will trick us. Please, Father, let me... Let me... No, my son. Report her to Mr. Brown. Tell him what you have told me. And please, since she is as beautiful as you say, do not have them arrest her in this house. In the morning, they can take her in the bazaar with the rest of the trash in Tangier. Will you wait here, madame? Sit on the stone. It's quite clean. I will return in a moment. But when can I see your father? He will lunch with us at home, madame. But wait here. I shall not be long. Do not go away, madame. I will be back soon. Will you come with me, please? Uh, are you speaking to me? Brown is the name. Allied intelligence. Will you come with me, please? I most certainly will not. I don't want to be brutal. I can't legally arrest you, but there are other ways. If you come with me, you will have a chance. But if you don't, you won't get out of this bazaar alive. <laughs> that's not being dramatic. That's a fact. Tangiers is a strange place. Please come quietly. Where? Allied headquarters. We have an old house. It's not far. Can't we discuss this, Mr. Brown? There is no Open need for... Open your a... suitcase, please. How, how did it get here? The boy. Open it. If you don't open it, I'll have to break it open. There. Mm-hmm. Now, what's this? Face powder. <laughs> mm-hmm. You, uh, you always wear platform soles on your shoes? Not always. There is no need to wreck my shoes. If you tell me what you're looking for, I'll be very glad to help. But... I don't know quite what I'm looking for. Mr. Brown, you may not believe this, but I am not a Nazi spy. Oh, come off it, lady. You had a private plane from Berlin. One of Mr. Goering's special numbers. You were seen going into El Kadir's house. He's the leading Nazi in Tangiers. Don't give me this cover stuff, please. You've got to believe me. I'm trying to locate the source of... Of, of what? I can't tell you. That's right, you can't. Is this what you picked up at El Kadir's? If it's a matter of money, Mr. Brown, we might come to terms. Sorry, there isn't that much money in the world. Now, what's in this? I don't know. It was in your suitcase. I don't know, I tell you. All right, let's open it. Well, why do you have to get face cream from El Kadir? I had no idea what was in the package. A jar of face cream? Or is it... You have no right to... What is it? Innocent, aren't you? Is it? Yes. Buried in the cold cream. But uh, naturally, you wouldn't know. I swear, I had no idea. I swear to you. I don't like women like you. Hello, Captain. Mm -hmm. Is this the young lady? Huh? Yes, sir. What is the verdict, Monsieur Brun? I'd say guilty, Captain. I assure you, Captain. Be that quiet, it's... please. Oui, Monsieur Brun. She arrived in one of Goering's private planes. Mm -hmm. She entertained the Gestapo in her hotel room. Mm -hmm. She tried to bribe me. She's tried about everything. The beggar's kid had me pick her up, and I found that in a suitcase. Mm, I see. Uh, uh, let me go! Let me go! Oh, well, don't be foolish. You can't possibly get away. Let go of me! I... <clears throat> you didn't have to hit her. Uh, Monsieur Brun, we have to kill her. Well, that's a bit risky, isn't it? Tangiers is a neutral zone. Uh, in Tangiers, murder is like love. The essence is quietness and privacy. 
Take her downstairs to our little room. We will take her to the cliffs tonight. A shot. A push. Voila. And nothing will be left. Nothing that the sea won't wash away. Take her downstairs, Captain. <laughs> I deliberately kept my cover. It would have been simple to prove I worked for the farmer, but I had a feeling I would be released. I knew that whoever got me out of this would be the person responsible for the leak in our Tangier's intelligence. Hours passed. Then he came for me. There must be laws about murder. Uh, that is why we are so discreet, mademoiselle. Uh, this will do, Monsieur Brun. It is quiet, dark, and deserted. Uh, mademoiselle, I know you will not force us to drag you screaming from the car. Huh? Gentlemen, the time has come for me to tell you the truth. As a matter of the fact, The time I... has come for you to get out, honey. Get out. Uh. You want me to do it? No, 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 no. Uh, wet ear. Proceed, mademoiselle. Captain, I must tell you that... Keep quiet. They will hear us. What? Please, keep quiet. What? When one has to shoot, one shoots quickly. Oh. Good. Now listen. Near here, there is a path down the cliff. It is very steep. Watch yourself. Yes. Almost directly beneath us is a small pier. I will pick you up there in a motorboat in an hour. Then you, you are... Oui, oui. Now be on the pier in an hour. I will get there as soon as I can get rid of this fool American. I wanted to sing, to shout. This was the leak. The head man of Allied espionage was a traitor. I groped my way down the rocky cliff and found the small pier just as he had said. I sat there in the cold, shivering, but exultant, and waited. Or shall we say what was concealed in the cold frame? You are very efficient. Thank you, Fräulein. I have been useful to the Reich Marshal on several occasions. You uh, will not forget to mention my name, huh? I will never forget you, never. Uh, merci. They are so stupid, these Americans. And uh, the English words, right under their very noses. Climbing down the cliff, I loosen my heel. Uh, have you a hammer? Uh, under the seat there is a toolbox. Uh, lift up the top. Have you got it? Yes, monsieur. Thank you. It will be greasy, mademoiselle. No one will notice the grease. I wish to do as you say, but al Qadir is one of the most influential Germans in Tangier. Captain Klein, we will take off at once. Uh, al Qadir said no. There was a body found in the Padala Hotel. It uh, seems that your room was... Small, Captain, but, yeah. do you recognize the signature on this card? Or must the pilot of the Reich be told who is Herman? 
to the face. We take off at once. You did splendidly, Karen. Splendidly. Thank you. But uh, I can't forget that little boy. It was horrible. Farmer, he wasn't a child. He was an old man. Our work will help build his future, Karen. Yes, I know. Incidentally, the package of uh, Frau Goering's, what was it? In a jar of cold cream, a small fortune in morphine. The jar got broken. I told Frau Goering I dropped it. She admitted it was uh, medicine for Hermann. She was very grateful. Apparently, Himmler has closed off the Reichsmarschall supply. And the leak in Tangiers is plugged for good. Plugged for good. With a hammer. A German hammer. You have just heard Ilona Massey starring in the new NBC presentation, Top Secret. And here she is with a clue about next week. Next week is assignment four. Philip Cornelius. His courage. His bravery. His tenderness. His escape. It is a personal story of mine. And until now, it has most certainly been top secret. Top Secret is directed and produced by Harry W. Junkin. The script was by Alan Sloan. Heard with Miss Massey tonight were Bryna Rayburn, Louis Van Ruten, Tommy Frederick, Earl Hammond, Carl Emery, and Bernard Grant. The music was composed and conducted by Dr. Roy Shield. This is Fred Collins speaking. NBC, the national broadcasting company. You have been listening to Golden Age Radio. Rumble.com slash C slash G-A-R. Brought to you by G3PL.com. Don't forget to subscribe for more videos. I would like to extend my sincere gratitude to Old Time Radio Research Group for their remarkable efforts in preserving and archiving the captivating world of old time radio programs. Their dedication to safeguarding these precious audio gems ensures that future generations can relish the enchanting stories, music, and entertainment of the past. Their invaluable contribution allows us to step back in time and experience the magic of radio history firsthand. Their link is in the description below.